Section 78 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 25. The Transference of Colonial Power to the United Provinces and England by Hugh E. Egerton, Part 2. The doings in the Far East, as has already shown in a previous chapter, decided for the time the question of Dutch hegemony. It remains briefly to sketch the small beginnings of the English dominion on the continent of India. No attempt was made to establish a trade depot on the mainland till the third expedition of the English East India Company, which started in March 1607, under William Keeling, William Hawkins, and David Middleton. They were directed to proceed to Cambay and to find a harbor safe from danger of the Portuguese or other enemies. Hawkins arrived at Surat in November and proceeded to Agra with letters to the great Mughal. Jahangir, Akbar's son and successor, had not inherited his father's wisdom and Portuguese intrigues prevailed against the success of the mission. The capture by the English of a Portuguese vessel, 1611, caused provisional leave to be given to trade at Surat, but the establishment of a regular factory was still forbidden. A brilliant victory won by the best in the following year removed the veto, and a license was granted for factories at Surat, and three other places on the Gulf of Cambay. The Portuguese resenting this invasion of their preserves. Downton, on arriving at Surat in 1614, found himself opposed by a powerful fleet. His tactics have been criticized, but they were attended with success and English prestige, therefore was greatly increased. In the following year, an important step was taken. Aldworth, to whose energy was mainly due the establishment of a factory at Surat, strongly advised that there should be a resident at the court of the Mogul, such a one whose person may breed regard. None of those who had successively visited the Mogul's court, Hawkins, Canning, Carriage, Edwards, were of this stamp, and Sir Thomas Rowe, whose experience of state business had been large, was now appointed ambassador to the great Mogul. Arriving in September 1615, he found his situation a difficult one. Through the instrumentality of a Jesuit, a treaty was in process of conclusion between the Mogul and the Portuguese, under which the English were to be shut out from Surat. In the end, however, a less formal peace was made. Jahangir, professing his inability to expel the English, as they were powerful at sea. The Portuguese might, if they chose, act on their own account, but they were, in all this quarter, in their wane, and might, while they are swimming for life, easily be sunk, a matter of great consequence. Rogue continued, as well to abate the pride of the Spanish Empire as to cut off one monster vein of their wealth. The offensive he held was both the nobler and the safer part. On the other hand, Portugal, as a decaying power, might be left to the operations of time, and the danger from the Dutch was more pressing. Roe himself recognized that these will speedily set a worm in your sides. Still, apart from the interests of England in the natural grouping of the powers in the struggle of European politics, Sentimental considerations were too strong to allow of a coalition between the English and Portuguese for the suppression of their Dutch rivals. Rowe's position was always precarious. The idea of an embassy presupposes a certain recognition of the principle of a balance of power, but it was difficult to make Jahangar believe that there were states with whom he might deal on terms of equality. The Portuguese had effected something by means of fear, 
but without the use of force, it was almost impossible to maintain prestige. Roe fought a losing battle with dignity and tact, but the risk of a catastrophe was too great for the experiment to be repeated. He had other causes of trouble. At first, his position was anomalous, a mere political representative. He had no authority with regard to the trade affairs, which were the politics of a trading company. In 1616, Roe resented the dispatch to Persia of a trading mission. He was not opposed to the opening of relations with Persia. On the contrary, recognizing the victory of the Dutch in the Far East and skeptical as to the advantages of the Japanese factory, he was strongly in favor of finding compensation in the Middle East. But he thought that Connex's hurried and premature mission would not forward that end. A grandiose scheme of the adventurer Shirley to secure to Spain a monopoly of the Persian silk trade was still in question, and the moment seemed inopportune to brave the Portuguese power at Ormuz. Nevertheless, after the receipt of fuller powers from the company, Roe did not recall Connock. In fact, the mission was by no means altogether a failure though it was not followed by the great results which the sanguine Connock had promised. Thus, in spite of mistakes and failures, and of the enmity of both the Portuguese and Dutch, the East India Company was able slowly to lay the foundations of that system, the final outcome of which was British India. By 1616, there were already four factories in the dominion of the Mughal, at Ahmadabad, Burampur, Ajmer, and Agra, the court factory, and Surat. On the east coast, there were factories at Mosulpatum and Petapoli. The capture of Ormuz from the Portuguese in 1622 added greatly to English prestige, though it was not retained in English hands. Still, throughout this period, the company remained a mere trading company, and in 1634 the factors could still write from Surat. In all the times of their trade in these parts, the company have not gained one place of note to keep their servants from being insulted over as they are in divers places, especially in Surat. Although a fort had been built at Armagon a few years earlier, in one sense British India may be said to date from 1640. The foundation of Fort St. George in that year marked the first milestone on that long road which was to lead an unconscious and reluctant trading company to the goal of an empire. Still, there was little to show the promise of the future. The settlements on the Bengal coast started in 1633 and seemed unlikely to be able to continue. Everywhere were to be found weakness and uncertainty. The contrast between these results and those achieved by the Dutch company is very striking. In 1616, the latter had already two forts in Ternati, three in Manchia, two in Galola, one in Bacian, one in Tidor, three in Amboina, one in Bandanera, and one in Pulu'ai. In Java, there was a fortress at Jakarta, nor did the Netherlanders confine their efforts to the eastern archipelago. On the continent of India, there was a fort at Pulikat. On the Coromandel coast, the appearance of Dutch traders at Surat in 1617 alarmed the English. The cunning Jahangar had admitted them on the ground that they were friends of the English. In Persia, too, the Dutch proved themselves successful rivals. In 1623, a commercial treaty was obtained by them, and in less than two years, According to the Dutch, the English were bursting for spite at their success in obtaining silk at a lower price than the English could. The English themselves allowed in 1634 that the Dutch had as fair quarters in Surat and Persia as they themselves had, supplying those places with more goods of the same sort as the English besides spices and china ware of all sorts to the value of 100,000 pounds in Persia. The Dutch, however, no less than the English, groaned under the insolence of the native rulers, 
and the rival traders had thus a common grievance. But while carrying on commercial rivalry with the English, the Dutch were never forgetful of their main object of seeking to undermine the Portuguese dominion. Several causes rendered this task more easy. The strength of the vast combined colonial empire was also its weakness, as there was constant jealousy and friction between Portuguese and Spaniards. In spite of a wasteful stream of immigration of women and children, the Portuguese dominion remained an exotic, casting no roots into the native soil. It was at once impecunious and corrupt, and was rendered intolerable to the native mind by its close connection with the aggressive methods of the Catholic Church. The original movement for discovery had indeed partaken of the character of a religious crusade, but while it was impossible to warn off the private missionary, the ruthless propagation of the gospel by means of the power of the state was, in the long run, as much against the spiritual interests of the church as it was against the political interest of the Portuguese. The dead weight of the religious establishment stifled the strength of the already impoverished state. In the absence of a territorial revenue, successive viceroys were compelled to levy high duties on the import and export of goods, thereby killing the trade. The commercial glory of Ormuz, Calicut, Cochin, and Amalaka had become a thing of the past, long before these places were actually lost by the Portuguese. Everywhere corruption, confusion, and jealousy prevailed. The entanglement of Portugal in the ruinous struggle of Spain with the Netherlands fired a mine which had been well prepared. The work of the Dutch was generally to finish where native engineers had been before. The Portuguese hold on the Spice Islands had always been precarious. Malacca had resisted more than one prolonged attack from native kings. Even in Ceylon, where more than elsewhere the Portuguese could claim real territory sovereignty, their position was never clearly recognized by the native princess. Still, in spite of all defects, the Portuguese power was too great to melt away rapidly. When, in 1640, Portugal obtained her independence, and when, it might be hoped, the grip of the Dutch would be relaxed. Portugal, apart from her African possessions, still held Muscat, Bandau, and Diu along the road to India. Between Diu and Goa, twelve forts were in her occupation. Beyond the well-fortified island of Goa, she held Onor, Barcelor, Mangalor, Conanor, Cringamore, Cochin, and Quilon. On the other side of India were forts at Negapatam, Miliapur, and Masalapatam. In Ceylon, Portugal still possessed Colombo, Manar, Gal, Negumbo, and Jaffnapatam, while in the Far East, Malacca, Macau, and a fort on Timor still remained of her former empire. A treaty between Portugal and the Netherlands, signed June 12, 1641, promised at least a ten years' breathing space to the harassed Portuguese. But already, in the previous January, Malacca, the key to the trade with China in the south, had surrendered to the Dutch, assisted by the King of Johor, after a blockade lasting more than seven months. The treaty did not take effect till its publication in October 1642, and in the following April, war was resumed by the Dutch on the ground that the Portuguese refused to evacuate the lowlands round Gali. The questions at issue were referred back for decision, but the Dutch, having taken the gumbo, refused to restore it according to the Hague Treaty of March 1645. The uneasy and short-lived peace which followed, under which Ceylon was divided between the two powers, was disturbed for the Portuguese by the capture by the Arabs of Muscat in 1648. So clear were the signs of the power of Portugal being on the wane, that native princes no longer asked for passports for their vessels. Already the glory had departed, 
and though the successive losses of Colombo, 1656, Jafnatapam and Nagatapam, 1658, Kilon, 1661, Cranganore and Cochin, 1662, following that of Cananore, 1653, belong to a period later than that dealt with in this chapter. The doom had been already pronounced on Portuguese India. The clause in the Treaty of Munster, January 30th, 1648, which stipulated that the Spaniards should adhere to the restrictions which they had previously observed in the matter of their navigation to the East Indies and not be at liberty to go further was a virtual recognition of the fact that the Netherlands had, to some extent at least, taken the place of Portugal as co-partner under the award of Alexander VI. Thirteen years later, Portugal, by recognizing the principle of Uri Posaditis in the East, formally submitted to Dutch superiority. But while the Dutch East India Company was helping to win for the fatherland, colonial supremacy, its own financial position was far from secure. It appears impossible to trace that position at any given time. A double set of books was, it seems, kept in which the business done in the East and in Europe was accounted for separately, and a real balance was never drawn. The published accounts were in fact untrustworthy. The payment of high dividends did not of necessity mean prosperity, as dividends might be, and sometimes were, paid out of borrowed money. It was inevitable that the heavy military charges should encroach on profits, so early as 1630, the 17 were ready to be smothered in the great expense which we have to bear single-handed. The Dutch, no less than the English company, suffered from the private trading of its ill-paid agents. Neither did the vast plans of its more able governor-general make for economy. Cohen saw visions of a large European immigration, such as should complete the beautiful work and enabled the Dutch to keep their stand against all pressures from outside. But the task of empire building does not mean working for quick returns. Although the English company played a less important part in our political history, during the period now under survey, the same tendencies were impairing its financial position. The trade had opened under auspicious circumstances, but the aggressive attitude of the Dutch and the city growth in the amount of the fixed charges soon altered the complexion of affairs. In 1621, the serious nature of the situation prompted the sending of Thomas Munn on a special mission to the East. The commission, however, was not to his mind, and five years later we find him recording the same bad results. According to Munn, the excessive charge was the cause of the company's declination. A gaining trade, he explained, required a return of three and a half to one upon real commodities. In fact, the company was on the horns of a dilemma. Doubtless it throve best when it sent out only ships with stock to sell and owned no settled factories. But under this system, it would everywhere be supplanted by the Dutch. The profits of evil might retort that keeping ships and factories in the East would soon drive the company out of existence. So serious was the situation that the company were nearly retiring from the struggle. In 1627, nothing was attempted. The East India Company, being indebted, disabled, and disheartened by former losses done by the Dutch, in addition to political troubles, there was the continuing canker of private trade, an evil which could only have been met by such an increase in the salaries of the factors as would secure the services of trustworthy men. Error, versatur, in general abolis. And doubtless there were among the factors, as well as among the sailors, men of the type of the devout Downton, the dower Cortho and the efficient methold. But upon the whole, the conclusion is forced upon us that, so far as the servants of the English India Company were concerned, 
The first half of the 17th century was the day of small things. The quarrelsome, Eric drinking factor may have been in a minority, but assuredly he makes a poor figure by the side of the clean living, energetic young civil servant of today. Nor is the reason of this state of things far to seek. The great wave of Elizabethan enterprise, upon the flood of which Drake, Cavendish, and their fellows had hurled themselves against the power of Spain, was on the ebb, and new national aspirations were giving rise to new forms of national energy. In the confused brain of James I, notions of tolerance were working, which were in time to revolutionize the foreign policy of civilized Europe. At the opposite scale, the influence of Puritanism was beginning to point the minds of adventurous men to ends other than those of a mere trading company. There were, of course, special political causes at work which fought against the company. It was compelled to rely upon the crown, and the poverty, not the will, of Charles I made him a most untrustworthy protector. The Asada Association, a body of interlopers upon the eastern trade, so named from a small island by Madagascar, which nearly wrecked the company's fortunes, owed its existence to Charles's need of money. At the same time, Charles had not the resolution to give the company the necessary three years' warning. When, in despair at its treatment by the king, the company turned to Parliament, it found the road barred by the natural prejudices against monopolies. It was not till a time later than our period, 1657, that Cromwell finally came to the conclusion that, in the special circumstances of the case, the privileged position of the East India Company was for the general interests of the Commonwealth. In 1649, the long struggle with the Asada merchants, which had brought both sides to the verge of ruin, was ended by the coalition of the rival interests. But the relief came too late, and it appeared as though the East India Company must become a thing of the past. Hereafter, the General Court affirmed in 1651, there will be little use of any governor, in regard they are to set no ships out, nor such other business, but to pay their debts. It seemed as though in the race for colonial supremacy, the United Provinces would easily distance their slower and heavily weighted rival. Although during the period in question, the struggle in the East was confined to the Portuguese, Dutch, and English, French ships had appeared in the East as early as 1602, and a French company for the Eastern trade with a stock of four million crowns was proposed in 1609. This project came to nothing, partly owing to the hostile attitude of the Dutch. French ships from time to time sailed to the East, but France was unable to push forward in the East as well as the West. In fact, the task in the West was too great for her, as the small results during the period in New France abundantly proved. A Danish East India Company was chartered in 1614, and we hear of the appearance of Danes at the mouth of the Gulf of Bengal, with great store of men, women, and children proposing, it appears, to inhabit there. A good example of the character of 17th century views as to colonization. The Danes remained for some years in Bengal, and had a fort and factory at Trankabar. But they suffered greatly from want of capital and were unable to achieve much, except to carry on a pillage, for which the Dutch were blamed by the native rulers. While in the east, the power of Portuguese was slowly breaking under the pressure of its northern rivals. In the west, the struggle for colonial supremacy assumed very different aspects in North and South America. The beginnings of the English and French American colonies are described in an earlier volume of this work. It will suffice here to recall that in 1606, a charter was granted under which two companies, the London Company and the Plymouth, were given the right to establish colonies in North America. The foundation by the London or Virginia Company of a colony at Jamestown laid the seed from which developed 
the province of Virginia. The Plymouth Company was less fortunate, its colony at Sagahawdog, proving a failure. The scruples of religion, however, affected for New England what the self-interest of a trading company seemed powerless to accomplish, and the arrival of the Mayflower Pilgrims in 1620 at Plymouth, followed by the great exodus which accompanied the granting of the Massachusetts Charter in 1629, secured an English population for New England. Connecticut and Rhode Island were plants grafted from the main stock of religious dissidents. The success of Virginia and New England prepared the way for the reappearance upon the scene of the principal individual grants and made possible the task of Lord Baltimore in founding the proprietary colony of Maryland, 1634. In French America, settlements so early as 1608 at Port Royal and Quebec contained the germ of the future Acadia and Canada. But all important, as were the beginnings of English and French colonization, from the point of view of world history, their immediate significance doubtless did not seem great to the men of the time. In the partition of America, Spain and Portugal had already taken the richest portions, and the English and French shares at best represented their leavings. Spanish pride was doubtless offended by the English venturing to poach upon the Spanish preserves, and it was the weakness rather than the goodwill of Spain which explained her practical acquiescence in the English claims. Still, it would have occurred to no one to suppose that the possession of Virginia or New England could seriously count in balance against the possession of Peru and Mexico. The threat held out to the Spanish supremacy by the foundation of the English colonies was of a much subtler and more elusive character, requiring generations for its accomplishment. It was the portentous birth of democracy, on congenial soil and under favorable auspices, which some 200 years later gave the quietus to Spain's colonial dominion. Meanwhile, in North America, a struggle for preeminence seemed already pending between the new powers, the existence of vague grants covering overlapping areas, involved inevitable difficulties, should the endeavor be made to enforce such grants seriously. Already in the period in question, the first round in the contest between England and France for mastery in North America began with the struggle for Acadia. Nevertheless, that struggle partook something of the nature of a rehearsal. The fight with the wilderness absorbed for the most part the energies of the infant colonies, and no deep laid scheme of aggrandizement had yet been planned in France. But while the various colonies existed rather in promise than in fulfillment, their future was being largely decided by the different methods of colonial government employed by the different powers. The form of a trading company never satisfied the French temperament, and French Canada never took real shape till she became an autocracy, founded on the model of the parent state. The beginnings of English North America, on the other hand, resembled the uncertain gropings of one in the dark. The failure of individual effort, in spite of the genius and perseverance of Raleigh, rendered natural the resort to the means of a trading company. But the numerous experiments made in methods of colonial government by James I and Charles I, reflect the uncertainty of contemporary thought. In 1606, a kind of Council for America, after the model of the Spanish Council for the Indies, was started, and the attempt was made to separate trade and political functions. Three years later, this attempt was abandoned, and the Virginia Company was left master in its house. The summoning of a popular assembly in 1619 called forth no protest from the home authorities. The resumption of the Virginia Charter in 1623 and a grandiloquent proclamation of Charles I in 1625 seemed to foreshadow a more active colonial policy. But the grant to the Massachusetts Company in 1629, and still more, the return to Elizabethan methods in the patent of Baltimore, 1632, 
again showed the absence of any settled principles of action. Yet more significant was the acquiescence in the transfer of the seat of government of the Massachusetts Company from England to America, a measure which in effect secured the practical independence of the New England colonies. It was, however, perhaps this slovenly inconsequence in the home policy which allowed English North America to develop in a way that no foreign power could imitate. It is probable that the profits of the East India trade may have reconciled Sir Thomas Smith and other directors of the Virginia Company to the absence of dividends, just as without the returns from the Kimberley diamond mines, the development of Rhodesia could not have been attempted by private efforts. In any case, the experience of the Virginia Company during its early years served to enforce the moral that, in the absence of the precious metals or of staple products, the empire builder builds for posterity and not for himself. In spite of all that was said and written as to the need of emigration, it proved, in fact, extremely difficult to find men ready and willing to embark upon the untrodden paths of colonization. Too often the Virginia Company, against its will, was obliged to yield to the theory which regarded the New World as the natural home for the failures of the old. With the appearance upon the scene of the religious motive to emigration, a new meaning was given to oversee enterprise. The sword of Brennus was cast into the scale in the development of the English colonies. Men little know the consequences of their actions, Nonetheless, it was the Stuart policy of religious intolerance at home and of allowing colonies as safety valves for dissent, which laid the sure foundations of the future United States. The story of the relations between the English and Dutch colonists well illustrates our meaning. So early as 1598, the American coast had been frequented by the Dutch, especially by members of the Greenland Company. But at first, no fixed settlements were made. An imposing grant of the whole coast, from Chesapeake Bay to Newfoundland, made in 1614 to two private individuals, became in 1621 the property of the newly formed Dutch West India Company. Although some settlements were founded and efforts made to bring in new colonists, New Netherland remained throughout its history a matter of very secondary interest, to the West India Company. The aim and object of the company had from the first been to carry on active war with Spain. The expected service for the welfare of our fatherland and the destruction of our hereditary enemy could not, they scornfully asserted, be accomplished by the trifling trade with the Indians or the tardy cultivation of uninhabitable regions. They recognized that, the colonizing of such wild and uncultivated countries demands more inhabitants than we can well supply, not so much from lack of population, in which our provinces abound, as from the fact that all who are inclined to do any sort of work here procure enough to eat without any trouble, and are therefore unwilling to go far from year on end uncertainty. The special circumstances of the English, on the other hand, enabled them to follow the advice given by Sir William Boswell, the English representative at The Hague, in 1642, to crowd on, crowding the Dutch out of those places where they have occupied, but without hostility or any act of violence. The only credit which Adam Smith allowed to the policy of Europe in establishment of colonies was that it had been magna virum mater, the main reason why the English prevailed was that under the English system, or no system, the necessary men were obtained as they were under no other. Lack of population in any case prevented the Netherlands from disputing with England the heritage of North America. End of section 78. Section 79 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 25 the transference of colonial power to the United Provinces and England by Hugh E. Egerton, Part 3. We have already said that other concerns than the peaceful development of overseas colonies occupied the minds of the Dutch West India Company. It was started as a move in the war game, and its fate was that without war it could not maintain a profitable existence. Under its charter, the company enjoyed a monopoly for 24 years of the trade with the western coast of Africa and with the West Indies and America. The company consisted of the five chambers of Amsterdam, Zeeland, Rotterdam, the Northern District, Horn and Friesland, and Groningen. The Amsterdam chamber held four-ninths of the stock, the Zeeland two-ninths, and the other chambers one-ninth each. The separate chambers had their separate directors, but the general administration of affairs was in the hands of a committee of 19, eight of whom were elected by the Amsterdam chamber, four by that of Zealand, and two by each of the other chambers. The 19th director was appointed by the States General. The political character of the company was further emphasized by the fact that the States General agreed to make an annual payment of 200,000 florins to the company, only one half of which was to rank for dividends. In the event of serious war, the States General further covenanted to furnish the company with 16 vessels of war and four yachts, on condition that the company furnished a similar fleet. The truce of 12 years between Spain and the Netherlands, which, so far as the colonies were concerned, had been no truce, expired in 1621, and the way was open to the new company to strike at the heart of Spanish power. The decision to direct the attack upon Brazil was probably wise, though it was criticized by Ossa Lennox, to whom the foundation of the West India Company was mainly due. In other ways, the constitution of the company did not follow the lines advised by Ossa Lennox. He was in favor of development by trade and colonization and distrusted the aggressive policy which prevailed. Brazil had been Portugal's most successful effort in colonization and between the short-sighted jealousy of Spanish statesmen and the apathy of the Portuguese inhabitants under the new dominion, there were grounds for the expectation that an attack might meet with success. The first triumph of the Dutch which is described in the preceding chapter, proved indeed delusive. San Salvador was taken in 1624 by a Dutch wars under Jacob Willikens and Piet Hein, only to be lost the following year. And though more than one attempt was made, San Salvador was never again a Dutch possession. To the north, however, their power gradually consolidated itself. Olinda, the capital of the captaincy of Pernambuco was taken in 1630, and though for two years the receipt of the mainland was the only Dutch territory, the defection of a mulatto, Calabar, from the Portuguese changed the complexion of affairs. The captaincies of Itamaraca, 1633, Rio Grande, 1633, and Parahiba, 1634, were conquered, and by the close of 1635, most of Pernambuco was in the possession of the Dutch. In the first year of the company, its enormous expenditure was in great measure recouped by the spoils taken from the enemy. Thus, after Piet Hein's successful capture of the Spanish treasure fleet in 1628, described in the preceding chapter, it has been already noted that not less than between 11 and 12 million florins were realized from the spoil, which served to pay the shareholders a dividend of over 50%. The vast scale of the company's workings may be gauged from the following figures. It is computed 
that between 1623 and 1626, it sent out no less than 806 vessels, with over 67,000 soldiers and sailors, and captured no less than about 550 ships of the enemy. It did not war with the Portuguese colony alone, but destroyed Truxillo in Central America and took the island of Curaçao in the West Indies from Spain. Splendid as were these results, they by no means pointed the way to commercial prosperity. The actual trade with Brazil amounted to very little, and it was decided to put things on a new basis by the appointment of a new governor-general. Hitherto, the method of government in Dutch Brazil had been unsatisfactory. The military commander had been ineligible for the post of president of the political council, and the civil and military officers sent home separate reports, the one to the directors of the company, the other to the state's general. Everywhere there was occasion for friction and misunderstandings. The appointment of Count Joan Maurice of Nassau to the chief command, civil and military, was an attempt to mend matters. The seven years of Joan Maurice's government of Brazil, January 1637 to May 1644, may be considered as the high watermark in the flood of Dutch colonial ascendancy. Hitherto the officers of the two companies, though often very able men, had, as a rule, belonged to a low social class and had been strongly imbued with the defects of their qualities. Count Joan Maurice of Nassau was by rank the superior of any of the viceroys of the haughty monarchs of Spain. Although contemporary gossip accused him of avarice, the best witness to his character is the esteem with which he was regarded by all classes. Portuguese had no less than Dutch in Brazil. His reputation stood so high in Portugal that it was seriously proposed at the time of the restoration of the Portuguese independence that he should be appointed commander-in-chief of the Portuguese forces in Brazil, by which means common action might have been secured against the Spanish enemy. The first business of Joan Maurice was to make good the Dutch hold on the province of Parambuco. Porto Calvo was taken, and a Dutch fort named after Joan Maurice was erected on the north bank of the San Francisco River. The rebuilding of the new capital, Recife, proclaimed the permanence of the Dutch dominion. At the same time, Joan Maurice recognized the pressing need of Dutch or German immigration if these claims were to be made good. He obtained a revenue from the sale to Portuguese owners of the abandoned sugar plantations. The conquest of Almina, 1637, secured a Dutch depot for the traffic in slaves, without which the sugar industry could not be made profitable. In the same year, the conquest of Ciara and Sir Gipi del Rey extended the limits of Dutch Brazil. Meanwhile, in spite of these successes, there was another side to the shield. From the first, Joan Maurice found himself crippled by the desire of the West India Company to limit expenditure. The fleet of 32 vessels, which had been promised him, dwindled to a force of 12 ships, and at no time had he more than 6,000 European troops under his command. The desire for economy on the part of the directors was, of course, reasonable. The financial position of the company had become serious. It was not, however, reasonable that the company should presume to direct the undertakings of their officer from home a policy foredoomed to failure. The responsibility for the unfortunate attack in 1638 upon San Salvador lay with the directors, and the governor-general's failure lowered his prestige in their eyes. Moreover, in other ways, the authority of the company exercised a sinister influence. Joan Maurice, whose views were far in advance of his time, had allowed full and complete religious liberties in Dutch Brazil. On the complaint of the Protestant ministers, he found himself compelled to curtail the public privileges both of the Roman Catholics and of the Jews. 
a change of policy, which had most unfortunate results. On the other hand, the action of the States General in restricting the monopoly of the West India Company to the importation of slaves and war material and to the exportation of dyeing woods tended to the welfare of the colony. In this state of things, and while, in spite of their brilliant exploits, the hold of the Dutch over the northern portions of Brazil was still precarious, the revolution occurred, 1640, by which Portugal recovered its independence. On the surface of things, there was now no longer cause of quarrel between the Netherlands and Portugal. They ought rather to have become partners in a common enmity to Spain. In fact, however, the thirst for colonial expansion had become so strong that both in the East and in the West, Portugal had become the Netherlands' real enemy. Accordingly, at the instigation and with the approval of the home authorities, the Governor-General, Joan Maurice, continued acts of hostility against Portugal. He sent out an expedition in 1641, which reduced St. Tomé and San Paul de Luanda. The reduction of Angola was of importance, and about 15,000 slaves had been annually exported from thence to Portuguese Brazil. Joe Maurice advised that the African possession should be under the control of the Brazilian government, but the West India Company disregarded his advice. In June 1641, peace was at last made between Portugal and the United Provinces, but in the event it proved no obstacle to Dutch aggression. Under this treaty, a truce of ten years was to take effect in the colonies. This provision, however, did not come into force until the ratification of the treaty by the King of Portugal had been transmitted to the Netherlands and published in Brazil. The news of the ratification did not reach the Netherlands till February 1642, so that the Portuguese had no legal cause for complaint at the Dutch doings of 1641. In that year, besides taking Angola, the Dutch had also conquered the province of Maranhão. They had further effectively occupied Sir Gippy del Rey, which had remained a waste since its conquest in 1637. But though within the letter of the law, these proceedings naturally exasperated the Portuguese. Already before the departure of Joan Maurice, there were ominous signs of the coming storm. Peace having been made, the company found itself compelled to practice economy and were now ready to dispense with their powerful governor, whom hitherto they had implored to remain in the colony. This decision, however natural, precipitated the crisis. Seeing that it had proved impossible to provide Brazil with a Dutch population, the only chance for the permanence of Dutch rule lay in enlisting the sympathies of the Portuguese inhabitants. A generous and excitable race, had responded readily to the advances of Maurice's large-minded rule. Doubtless some took pride in the efforts which made Brazil a seat of varied culture, such as it was not to become again till the time of its last emperor. The note of progress proving in either case the swan song of a dying regime. Moreover, the relations between Joan Maurice and the directors were already strained, he complained bitterly of his treatment by them. A new council of finance had been instituted, which he affirmed usurped the entire control of affairs. They ignored the existence of Joan Maurice on the ground that no mention of him was made in their instructions. He recognized the seriousness of the situation and believed that the only remedy lay in joining into one strong body the separate interests of the Dutch East and West India companies. Unhappily, the voices of the holders of East India stock were too powerful for any such measure to be within the range of practical politics, and events pursued their course till the final loss of Brazil in 1654. The expectations of shrewd onlookers may be gauged from the fact that at the time of Joan Maurice's departure, a body of Jews abandoned Brazil and sought a new home on the Surahan River. 
the recovery of Portuguese independence had given a new meaning to resistance in Brazil, and disaffection grew apace. Economic considerations tended in the same direction. Joan Maurice had allowed the Portuguese to purchase plantations on credit, so that to them, escape from Dutch rule would mean escape from financial obligations. In this state of things, the Brazilian patriot Vieira found ready helpers in the work of rebellion. The former orders of King John IV counted for little against the secret assistance of the Portuguese authorities at San Salvador. The failure of the Dutch fleet under Wit de Wuth, which reached the Recife in March 1648, announced the doom of the Dutch dominion, though in fact a brave resistance was made for another five years. The Dutch historian of the proceedings of his countrymen in Brazil freely recognizes that Brazil owed its emancipation from the Dutch rule to the same spirit of patriotism which inspired the Netherlands in their resistance to Spain. The contrast between the methods of the Dutch and those of the English in dealing with the Spanish-Portuguese colonial empire was strikingly shown in the action respectively taken by them in South America. We have seen how the Dutch struck straight at the heart of Portuguese dominion, though failing, failed by the intrusion of a new force which in time would destroy both Spanish and Portuguese power in the New World. The melancholy story of Raleigh's second expedition to Guiana, 1617, represents the most conspicuous English effort to be set against Dutch achievements. In his memorable Discovery of the Empire of Guiana, 1596, Raleigh had clearly pointed out a better India for Her Majesty than the King of Spain hath any. He had boldly asserted, That empire, now by me discovered, shall suffice to enable Her Majesty in the whole kingdom, with no less quantity of treasure than the King of Spain hath in all the Indies, east as well as west, which he possesseth. Guiana was a country that hath yet her maidenhead, never sacked, turned nor wrought. It has never been entered by an army of strength and never conquered or possessed by any Christian prince. It was, moreover, so defensible that two forts at the mouth of the Horonoco would prevent the entrance of any hostile vessels. According, then, to Raleigh's original policy, Guiana was to become an English possession, just as Peru belonged to Spain. The tragedy of the situation in 1617 lay in the fact that this empire builder found himself cabined within the four corners of a squalid search for gold mines. It does not follow that the forward policy of the inheritors of the Elizabethan tradition was right. Raleigh himself may be cited for the contrary view. At his trial in 1603, he said, I knew the state of Spain well. His weakness his poorness, his humbleness at this time. I knew that when, before time, he was wont to have forty great sails, at the least in his ports. Now he hath not, past six or seven. I knew his pride so abated that, notwithstanding his former high time, he was become glad to congratulate his majesty and send unto him. It would be ridiculous to compare the bungling policy of James I or Charles I with that of the great French statesman. Nevertheless, time was in favor of their hesitating caution, as it was of the far-seeing aims of Mazarin. But though much might be said for the policy of leaving the overgrown Spanish dominion to die, James's behavior towards Raleigh is by no means therefore justified. There can be no doubt that the expedition of 1617 was first encouraged and then disavowed. It was notorious that there were Spaniards inhabiting along the Orinoco. The size of the fleet was such as to make it unlikely that a mere peaceful exploration was intended. Moreover, Raleigh refused the Spanish ambassadors offered that, if he would undertake to go with only one or two ships, he should receive a safe convoy home for himself and the discovered gold. James allowed the expedition, then gave Gondomar 
detailed information with regard to it and awaited the event. When the expedition had failed in its overt object, the finding of the gold mine, and when furthermore it had involved hostilities with the Spaniards, Raleigh was offered an easy sacrifice to the remonstrances of Gondomar. The execution of Raleigh and the massacre at Amboina marked the dangers to which the policy of caution was exposed. Raleigh's failure did not wholly deter Englishmen from schemes of colonization in South America. A colony was attempted at Guayapoca by Charles Lee in 1605. In 1609, Robert Harcourt started a colony in Guyana, receiving four years later a grant of the country between the rivers Amazon and Dolisquiba. In 1619, a further attempt was made to plant a colony on the Amazon under the direction of Roger North, who had served in Raleigh's expedition. Upon complaint by Gondomar, the commission was revoked and North committed to prison, 1621. Some five years later, he wrote to Buckingham that on the first occasion he had left on the Amazon 100 gentlemen and others, many of whom still remained dispersed among the Indians. At this time, 1626, a new patent was obtained. Buckingham became governor of the company, and the grant included Guiana and the Royal River of the Amazon. Although English settlements for some time maintained a precarious existence on the Amazon, in this quarter also, the energy of the Dutch produced greater results. Already about 1600, two small forts named Nassau and Orange were built by them on the Amazon, and in 1616, a Zealand expedition added another. This was abandoned in 1623, and the same year witnessed the reduction by the Portuguese of Nassau and Orange. The Dutch West India Company attempted to retrieve the situation, but the Portuguese had at their disposal superior forces, and at so early a date as 1631, Dutch trading on the Amazon had been a thing of the past. The conquest of Baron Howe by the Dutch in 1641 held out the promise of extending their dominion northward. But Maranhau was lost in the following year, and henceforth no attempt could be made to dispute with Portugal the mastery of the Amazon. To the north, however, in Guiana, there was still room for the new powers to plant colonies. We have seen that many Jews had emigrated to Suriname, and an English colony was started here in 1650, by Lord Willoughby of Parnham, the governor of Barbados. It soon became a hopeful colony and appears to have flourished. In 1667, after conquest by the Dutch, it remained under the Treaty of Breda, a Dutch procession. In West Guiana, the Dutch had been for long active. Groenewegen founded a colony on the Esquibo in 1616, and was its presiding genius for 48 years. He was the first man, we are told, here in emulating Raleigh, that took firm footing in Guiana by the good liking of the natives. Another settlement on the Pomeroon was founded in 1650 and received in the following year a great accession of strength from an influx of Dutch and Jews driven from Brazil by the Portuguese successes. In South America, the French were also already in the field. Their colony at Cayenne dates from 1625, though its development did not take place till a later period, after 1663. But, while in Guiana, no less than elsewhere, the Dutch doings eclipsed the English. The English found their main work in the development of their West Indian islands. The policy of settling upon islands which had been left untouched by the Spaniards in their various expeditions was reasonable, but the actual settlements were due to the initiative of adventurous individuals rather than to any deep-laid scheme on the part of the English government. Although the first flush of the Elizabethan dawn was no longer in the sky, a glow of romance still hung around colonizing efforts. For example, Daniel Gookin, in 1631,
bravely requests the grant of the island of St. Brandon, and the grant is no less gravely made. The Duke of Buckingham himself, when the virtual ruler of England, seems to have contemplated, if his fortunes failed at home, retiring to the West Indies, there to found an independent principality under the aegis of Gustavus Eldolfus. The Bermudas, the Leeward Islands of Antigua, St. Kitts, and Nevis, and the island Barbados, was settled between 1609 and 1632. Yet even here the English displayed their economic inferiority to their Dutch rivals. Of all the English West Indian islands, Barbados was at the time by far the most important. But the settlement of Barbados was mainly due to Sir William Courtine, a London merchant of Flemish origin, who provided the funds for the expedition sent out in 1625, which took possession of the island in the name of the Earl of Pembroke in 1626. Moreover, Barbados owed its prosperity chiefly to the introduction of the sugar cane about 1637 by a Dutchman, and to the actor trade carried on by Dutch ships. Some remarkable results from the introduction of sugar are stated by a contemporary observer. He affirms that the population was thereby reduced from over 18,000 to some 8,000 fighting men, one half of whom were dissolute English, Scotch, and Irish. The number of landed proprietors was reduced from over 11,000 to some 750. The island was 17 times as rich as it was before the making of sugar, and not so defensible. On the important economic questions, he has suggested, it must suffice to note that Dutch enterprise was in this instance the propelling force. Throughout the period, English policy was, for the most part, haphazard and tentative. The conscious beginning of the mercantile system dates from the passing of the First Navigation Act, in 1651. But if, in the field of economics, the English were the followers of the Dutch, in another direction they broke new ground. The democratic character of the English-American colonies has become a historical commonplace. The manner in which self-government permeated New England was noted with amazement and envy by the Dutch colonists of New Netherland. They asked in vain for suitable municipal government, and that those interested in the country may also attend to its government. In New England, they noted that there were neither patrons, lords, nor princes, only the people, and thus government rested on a basis of popular goodwill unknown elsewhere. The real difference between New Netherland and the English colonies lay in the fact that while the latter, more or less, owed their origin to the economic interests of persons in the mother country, in every case such interests came to be secondary under the pressure of the conflicting interests of the new populations. New Netherland, on the other hand, so long as it lasted, remained a strictly commercial venture run on commercial lines. The peculiar character of the English colonial system puzzled the English statesmen of the time. To plant tobacco on Puritanism only seemed to Connington a grotesque form of national expansion. Nevertheless, in the fashioning of the outline of future world power, the evolution, however clumsily and reluctantly effected, of a self-governing empire had a higher importance than could have belonged to the most prosperous balance sheet of secured profits. For it was not only in the American colonies, where, for various reasons, the spirit of independence was indigenous, that we find the claim for self-government. The West Indies were, for the most part, settled by men who were neither nonconformist in religion nor in politics adherents of the party opposed to the prerogative. Barbados, according to Clarendon, was principally inhabited by men who had resorted thither only to be quiet and to be free from the noise and oppressions in England, and without any ill thought toward the king. And yet in these islands, and especially in Barbados, popular assemblies developed no less naturally than in the American colonies. 
The exact date at which the first popular assembly was summoned at Barbados is uncertain, but in the Articles of Surrender of January 11, 1652, it was explicitly affirmed that the government of this island be a governor, council, and assembly, according to the ancient and usual custom here. Government by an assembly, as well as governor and council, was always claimed by the inhabitants as their birthright derived from the king's patent to the Earl of Carlisle, and the assembly is described by a contemporary as semblance to the Parliament of England. Sir Thomas Motifood, whose defection to the side of Parliament was a contributing cause to Willoughby's peaceful surrender of the island in 1652, wrote that the people would delight to have the same form of government as was in England, and added the immodest suggestion that two representatives should be chosen by the island to sit and vote in the English Parliament. The independent attitude of Barbados is further attested by the report, June 30, 1652, that some persons had a design to make this place a free state and not run any fortune with England, either in peace or war. The same spirit is found active wherever Englishmen settled. In 1639, the Earl of Warwick attempted the desperate business of sending a colony to the island of Trinidad. The precariousness of their position, however, did not lead the colonists to forget their political rights. They claimed the right to elect their own governor as one of the privileges which were the grounds of their leaving their mother country. In the same spirit, among the inducements put forward by Warwick to attract in 1647 emigrants to Tobago was the promise that, as the island became inhabited, every hundred or some other convenient number should have power to elect yearly a fit person to be of the general assembly of the island, such assembly to consist of not less than 30, nor more than 60 members. The records of the company, consisting of Lord Warwick, Pym, and other leaders of the Puritan party, which planted the settlement on Providence Island, near the Mosquito Coast, 1630, point the same moral. The island was held of great importance from its position, and in 1635 successfully resisted an attack from a Spanish fleet. Nevertheless, in this quasi-military possession, the government lay with the council chosen by the principal inhabitants. Here, as elsewhere, the English colonists discussed politics and allowed himself to be distanced by the Netherlanders in the economic race. The alarm at Dutch influence is very noticeable. No Hollander could own land, though he might hold it as occupier. Dutch names for forts or bays were forbidden, but such measures were powerless to prevent the trade of the island from remaining in Dutch hands. So hopeless proved the financial position of the company that in 1637 we find negotiations for the sale of its interests to the Dutch West India Company. Nothing, however, came of this transaction, and in 1641 the English were driven from the island by a Spanish force. But while in the West Indies the Dutch were generally content to extract the marrow, leaving the English the bone, the French were already rivals in the political field. While in England projects for a West India Company came to nothing, the French, Company for the Islands of America, was incorporated in 1626, and through it, Martinique and Guadalupe were settled in 1635. The first regular settlement of the French in the West Indies was made at St. Kitts in 1625. Two years later, then the arrival of the English under Thomas Warner. The amicable arrangement under which the French and English divided the island, further covenanting to remain at peace though their mother country should be at war, well illustrates the political situation. The power of Spain was still too great in the West Indies, and the danger from Caribs too immediate, to allow of hostilities between the intruding powers. It was not till a later date that the conflict between France and England arose in these parts. Besides Curaçao, the Dutch possessed Santa Cruz, 1625, 
St. Eustatius, 1632, and other islands. The appearance of other powers in the West Indies belongs to a later date. Gustavus Adolphus indeed aimed at colonizing unoccupied territories in the West Indies, when, urged by the indefatigable Eusolinix, who had for the time abandoned his ungrateful country, he founded, 1627, a South Sea Company. The company, though it maintained a lingering existence for some years, was a failure, and European politics forbade the further advance of Gustavus Adolphus into the field of colonial expansion. But Oxenstierna carried on, so far as he was able, his master's policy and the foundation of a Swedish colony on the Delaware, 1638, and the Swedish African Company started in 1647, entitled Sweden to rank among the colonizing powers. But here again, the impetus to Swedish efforts was given by Dutch traders, who, with the view of wreaking their resentment on the monopolies of the Dutch East and West India companies, induced the Swedes to plant settlements in the very midst of the Dutch West African fords and factories. The connection between West Africa and the West Indies was so close that, as we have seen, Maurice proposed that the Dutch conquests in the former should be placed under the government of Brazil. Nevertheless, the full extent of that connection did not appear till the slave trade became more and more an organized industry. The object of the English company founded in 1618 was to adventure in the golden trade. Forts were erected on the Gambia and at Cormentine and on the Gold Coast. The object of the company, however, was to open up a trade in gold with Timbuktu, and in these circumstances, its success was naturally not great. The second African company, founded in 1631, seems to have sent some slaves to the West Indies, but the development of the trade belongs to a later period. Although tradition connected the French with West African exploration, they restricted themselves for the most part during the period in question to the region of the Senegal. A French West African company founded in 1626 was in 1664 merged in the reconstituted French West India Company. The Dutch were later in the field than either the French or the English, but when they came, it was with greater energy and with the intention of ousting the Portuguese. The island of Glory, off Cape Verde, was acquired in 1617, and in 1624 Fort Nassau was erected at Moree, on the Gold Coast. The capture of Elmina, 1637, was followed five years later by the taking of the Portuguese fort at Axum, and henceforth the Portuguese recognized the predominant position of the Dutch upon the Gold Coast. End of section 79. Section 80 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 26. The Fantastic School of English Poetry by A. Clotten Brock, Part 1. The poetry which we call Elizabethan survived at least to the Restoration. Indeed, the dramatic influence of Beaumont and Fletcher lasted for some time after it in romantic plays such as Dryden's All for Love. But the decline of that poetry had begun so soon as a change fell upon the conditions which produced it, and signs of that decline and of the poetic reaction which took the form of what is known as the fantastic poetry appeared even before the death of Elizabeth. The first and most powerful of the fantastic poets was John Donne, who was born about 1573, and according to Ben Jonson, he wrote all his best pieces before he was 25 years old. This is not quite true, but it is true that before the end of the 16th century, Donne wrote many poems possessing all the characteristics of the new poetry of the 17th. 
he was the chief agent in a poetic revolution, which, though it was far from universal, and though some of its effects were transitory and some injurious, yet deserves to be studied as a part of the history both of society and of literature. The literary changes which it effected were an expression of moral and political changes. The fantastic poets were not mere triflers with words and images. Indeed, there have seldom been writers who have tried with more seriousness and honesty to express the truth as they saw it. Much of Dan's poetry may seem preposterously unreal to us, yet he was praised by his contemporaries mainly for his novel realism. Herbert wrote of his religion with a profusion of homely detail which proves that it was the most real and familiar part of his life to him, and even a minor poet like Habington could be moved by the spectacle of a starry night to ideas which seem to us both more modern and more profound than any to be found in any Elizabethan poetry except Shakespeare's. The faults of the fantastic poets are many and glaring, but they have a peculiar interest of their own. Their extravagances and incongruities, both of style and of thought, reflect the extravagances and incongruities of an age of transition and revolution, an age violent and uncompromising both in action and in ideas. But just as the political conflicts of that age produced characters of a beauty and temper not to be found in less exacting times, so the fantastic poets, in their conflicts of thought, produced beauties, things extreme and scattering bright, to quote the words of Don, which cannot be paralleled in any other period of our literature. Don's object was realism, and he proved this in the satires which were his first works. But it was his love poems that first displayed his real powers, and the contrast between them and any Elizabethan love poetry is very sharp. Don was a realist not so much of facts as of the imagination. His object, when he wrote love poems, was not to produce beautiful verses, but to show exactly how his own individual imagination was worked upon by his own individual passion, and this he tried to do so that he might explain himself to himself. This is the chief respect in which he and most of the other fantastic poets differ from the Elizabethans. The Elizabethans, in their lyrics and their sonnets, no less than in their plays, seem to write for an audience, the fantastic poets seem to write for themselves alone. And this difference only reflects the difference between the 16th and the 17th centuries. The age of Elizabeth was one of national unity. Poets then, like everyone else, were Englishmen first and themselves afterwards, and their poetry expressed that national unity. Like the Venetian painters of the great age, they were all, in spite of individual differences and disputes, members of one great school, confident in their common aim and in the public understanding and applause. The drama was the chief form of their art, and a living drama is always written for an audience and lives in the approval of that audience. The drama naturally dominated all other forms of poetry and imbued them with its characteristics. And, like the drama, these other forms of poetry were written for an audience. Elizabethan lyrics were, as hymns are now, written to be sung by all the world. And even Shakespeare's sonnets, the most individual and passionate love poems of the age, often read like lyrical and rhymed speeches out of his earlier plays. Naturally, therefore, this poetry was apt to express universal rather than individual emotions, since its object was to express what all felt and could enjoy. 
The Elizabethan lyric poet wrote to express not something that occurred to himself alone, but something old and universal, such as any lover could sing to his mistress without incongruity, and his whole poetic energy was spent upon saying these old things better than they had ever been said before. Hence the extraordinary verbal beauty and the high level of execution, even in minor poets of the Elizabethan age. It is clear, however, that Don was tired of this verbal beauty. Though he was anything but a Puritan himself, there was something Puritanic in his view of his art. He despised poetry which took the line of least resistance, as the Puritans despised men who lived easily. He thought it the duty of a poet to wrestle with all the difficulties of thought, and he did not care if he lost all graces of manner in the process. In his reaction from Elizabethan fluency and ease, he was often willfully harsh and obscure. Ben Johnson said that he deserved hanging, quote, for not keeping of accent, end quote. And he said this because he knew that the violence which Don often did to his rhythm was willful. He was so determined not to smooth his verse away to suit his rhythm that he would often purposely avoid some rhythmical beauty because it was usual in Elizabethan poetry. This dislike of the obvious is a common disease in writers who come at the end of a great age of literature. It often implies an exhaustion of subject matter. Poets are careful to say nothing as it has been said before when they have little to say. But Don and his chief followers do not lack subject matter, far from it. Their defect usually is that they have too much to say, and that much of their subject matter is not proper to poetry. What poetry ought to express is the result rather than the process of reasoning. But Don is forever arguing in his verse. He was the earliest poet of a new age which argued about everything with a passion that has died out of modern controversy, and it is passion which often turns his versified arguments into great poetry. In his case, it is not the passion of political or theological controversy, but that of love or devotion, or of an intense contemplation of the mysteries of life and death. Yet that passion nearly always expresses itself in an argumentative form. He is always laboring to prove that his love is not like the love of other men. When he leaves his wife, he argues that their bodily separation is not a real separation. In a strange and beautiful poem called Air and Angels, he argues with extraordinary subtlety about the incorporeal nature of love and the fallacy that it can only be excited by corporeal beauty. In another poem, Love's Growth, he discusses the paradox that love is infinite yet capable of continual increase. And this passion for arguments is the real cause of his celebrated quote-unquote wit, and of his frequent misuse of it. Wit is not an invention of Don's, nor did he or the other fantastic poets get it altogether from foreign sources. It is doubtful indeed whether most of them got it from foreign sources at all. The Elizabethans delighted in wit, but only as an ornament. They had the superfluity of energy which spends itself in putting old things in a new way. They would often digress into a mere juggling of words, into puns and arbitrary analogies suggested by sound rather than by sense, which even in Shakespeare seem to us irrelevant and tiresome. This kind of wit was a favorite amusement not only among the poets, but in a fashionable society, Yet it was always a mere amusement, the mere expression of a superfluous energy. But Don's wit and the wit of all the fantastic poets was serious. It became their natural medium of expression, even when they were treating the most serious subjects. Their deepest imagination expressed itself in wit because it expressed itself in arguments. 
In fact, their wit was the result of an attempt to argue poetically, for images are natural to poetry, and their wit is usually the condensation of an argument into an image or an analogy. By its frequent incongruity, it expresses the incongruity of their aims. They had the ambition to be both poets and metaphysicians in the same breath. They analyzed their emotions with as much passion as if they had been simply expressing them. They thought to convince and charm by one and the same process. Argument delights in novel analogies and images. It tries to convince by the very ingenuity of its illustrations. But passion thinks too rapidly to be ingenious, and convinces not by the ingenuity but by the beauty of its expression. That famous image of dawns of the stiff twin compasses might illustrate and advance a prosaic argument very neatly. It is an incongruous illustration of the unity of two lovers because it is so ingenious that we cannot believe any man in a rapture of devotion could have exercised his mind coolly enough to hit upon it, and because it is not one of those illustrations taken from beautiful objects to which the passion of love naturally flies. The poem in which that illustration occurs, The Valediction Forbidding Morning, is a good example of the manner in which Don's minds, and indeed the minds of most of the fantastic poets, were apt to work. When he begins, passion and argument are harmonious in his mind, but their harmony is only accidental, since they are produced by different instincts. As Don is writing a love poem, the argument should be subordinate to the emotion. But it is not, and so their concord is only momentary. After a few verses, the reason overpowers the emotion and settles down into an expression not of that emotion, but of its own ingenuity. This confusion and incongruity of aim are to be found not only in all the most serious verse and prose of the age, excepting only the verse of Milton. They are also to be found in its entire life. In the 17th century, there was a general confusion of reason and passion. An elaborate machinery of dialectics had survived from the Middle Ages, when differences of religious belief were determined more often by the sword than by argument, and when argument was mainly about abstract subjects in which the personal interests of the disputants were not deeply concerned. The Reformation and the Renaissance produced enough skepticism to make argument about first principles possible, and the 17th century was an age of revolution, because then men argued about first principles and about matters which concerned them deeply. But the passions engendered by this new kind of argument disordered the old machinery of dialectics, which was still employed, and produced a general confusion of mind, in which men could not distinguish between their reason and their emotions, and in which poetry and prose were often employed to do each other's work. The object of most of Milton's prose is controversial, but his arguments are confused with passion, just as the passions of the fantastic poets are confused with their arguments. His prose is half poetry, impeded by its medium of expression, because he tried to write prose in an age which was not only unable to argue about passion, but which mistook passion for argument. And so the poetry of the fantastic poets is half prose, impeded by its medium of expression, because they tried to write poetry in an age which could not express its emotions without reasoning about them. Both the prose and the poetry, therefore, are labored and cloudy, Yet in both cases the clouds are sometimes pierced by dazzling lightnings which could not be kindled except out of so fierce a conflict of reason and passion. Don, said Ben Jonson, was the first poet in the world in some things, and in all the great fantastic poets things are to be found so deeply and so finely said that for the moment all other kinds of poetry seem to be shallow beside them. 
Their beauties delight the more because they seem to be undesigned like the beauties of nature and like the most beautiful actions to spring out of a war of opposing forces. In their poetry we see not merely the triumphs of expression, but the labor and sweat that have gone before them, and so the triumphs, when they come, seem the more splendid. The failures of their poetry, glaring as they are, do not incline us to distrust their successes. These failures are not plausible like those of poets whose chief aim is to please. No one could be deceived for a moment into thinking that their defects were excellences. They seem always to be working against the grain, to be following the line of greatest resistance. They court difficulties. They will not pretend to be sure of beauty when they are not sure, to be more impassioned than they are. They will not even yield to passion when they are also possessed by thought. So their passion has to master their thought if it is to master them. And when it does master them and triumphs in their poetry, it is enriched and weighted by all the rebellious mass of thought which it has overcome. It satisfies simultaneously both our sense of beauty and our reason. It must be confessed that there are not many even of Donne's love poems which, like the magnificent anniversary, satisfy our sense of beauty from the first line to the last. His other poems, satiric, philosophic, familiar, and devotional, are beautiful only by fits and starts. Only in his youth was he a poet by profession, and he soon came to repent of his youthful amorous verse. He never published it and wished to efface the memory of it. Even in the most reckless moods of that youth he is never really light-hearted, as many Elizabethan lyrics are light-hearted. He argues with a kind of perverted strenuousness in favor of frivolity and inconstancy, and in later years he became the most serious of men. He brooded over his sins and the thought of his own death like a medieval ascetic. Yet he enriched his broodings with all the new critical and analytical methods of his own time. The most famous of his religious poems, if they can be called religious poems, are the first and second anniversaries, written at the request of a generous patron in memory of his daughter, Elizabeth Drury, whom Don had never seen. Dawn enumerates her perfections with an extravagance that might seem servile if it were not redeemed with images so magnificent and thoughts so profound. These thoughts and images prove that his real object was not to pay compliments to an individual, but to brood upon death as the inexplicable end of things beautiful and excellent, and not only upon death, but upon the whole universe, the spectacle of which, seen in the fitful light of the new knowledge, dazzled and bewildered him for all his passionate faith. Quote, new philosophy calls all in doubt. The element of fire is quite put out. The sun is lost and the earth, and no man's wit can well direct him where to look for it. And freely man confess that this world spent when in the planets and the firmament they seek so many new, they see that this is crumbled out again to his atomies. Tis all in pieces, all coherence gone, all just supply and all relation. End quote. Death was not a simple and tragical fact to Don, as it had been to the Elizabethans. Indeed, no fact was simple to him. He was filled with a new sense of the relations of things. But the relations were not clear in his mind. Life was a tangled web through which he felt, seeking for an end and not finding one. And so he was seldom a poet of pure religion, as he had been seldom a poet of pure passion. The latter part of his life, he was made Dean of St. Paul's in 1621 and died in 1631, 
was clouded with a melancholy produced partly by ill health, partly by too intense a sense of the mystery of things. The final impression produced by his verse is that he was the hamlet of poetry, that he overtasked himself with a process of thought preliminary to writing, and that his verse, for all its fitful magnificence, never expressed the full extent of his powers. End of section 80. Section 81 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 26. The Fantastic School of English Poetry by A. Clutton Brock, Part 2. Apart from Donne, most of the best verse of the fantastic poets is religious. Both in their subject matter and in their way of treating it, they express the character of their age. Religion is taken for granted by most Elizabethans. In the 17th century it becomes self-conscious, as love becomes self-conscious in Donne. It takes stock of itself and of the world. It reasons and analyzes. The religious verse of the fantastic poets does not express pure devotion any more than Donne's love poems express pure passion. These poets did not write hymns any more than Donne wrote songs. They amused in verse, as he did, to satisfy themselves about the truth of the things which most deeply concerned them, and to express that truth when they had discovered it. Their poetry is the work of men living in an age of religious controversy and painfully anxious to be certain of their beliefs. It is also the work of men to whom their religion, being so much questioned and controverted, is the most real part of their lives. None of the great fantastic poets were Puritans, yet the same new seriousness which produced the Puritans made them write religious poetry filled with a new reality and intensity. One of the chief objects of their poetry was to justify the instinct which made them poets, to show that their love of beautiful things was not inconsistent with a concern for righteousness as deep as that of the Puritans, though more kindly. In all their work there is an implied protest against the Puritan idea of the vileness of men and the perpetual anger of God. Herbert and Vaughan, in particular, are devout humanists who would prove that man is not too base to be friends with God, that the world is not a prison of condemned criminals, but a home of beauty and peace for the righteous, and full of hints and promises of the celestial delights in store for them. They show a pathetic eagerness to justify the ways of God to man, and with an imagination more truly religious than Milton's, they cannot be content with a mere dogmatic statement that whatever God may do is good. They must be forever analyzing the relations between God and man, and proving the beneficence of God through that analysis. The critical, questioning spirit of their age does not lead them into skepticism, but into an anxious examination of life and of their own minds as they appear in the lights of the Christian faith. Poetry, they are eager to prove, comes not from Parnassus, but from heaven, and they try to make it a kind of link between heaven and earth. They are always tracing connection between celestial and earthly things. They exhibit the homeliness, and what often seems to us the incongruity, of an imagination so possessed by religion that even the most trivial things have a religious significance for it, and they are only too quick to imitate the wit of Donne. It is almost a point of duty with them to unite the homely with the sublime in their images, and no literary tradition, no rules of good taste deter them from doing so. Like Don, they were contemptuous of Elizabethan conventions, though for a different reason. It is common form for the religious fantastic poets 
to complain that hitherto poetry has been degraded to the service of profane themes and desecrated with heathenish ornaments, and to declare their purpose of putting it to better uses. Herbert indeed proclaims that, since he is to write of the truth, he will write plainly. Quote, who says that fiction only and false hair become a verse? Is there in truth no beauty? Is all good structure but a winding stair? May no lines pass except they do their duty, not to a true but painted chair? Quote. It may seem strange that Herbert should protest his intention to be plain, that he, of all men, should ask, quote, must all be veiled while he that reads divines catching the sense in two removes? End quote. In Herbert's verse, as in Don's, the sense often has to be caught at two removes or more, but both Don and Herbert were probably quite unaware of their obscurities. In their restless eagerness to analyze everything, it was natural to them to think of everything in terms of something else. The principle of their realism was to illustrate ideas with objects. They almost tried to turn ideas into objects so that they might make them plain. And their minds jumped from the idea to the object which illustrated it with a rapidity hard to follow. Herbert, in intention at least, is the most realistic of poets. He was a close friend of Don, though twenty years his junior. He was born in 1593 and died in 1632. And he was the closest of Don's followers among the greater fantastic poets. No doubt it was Don's realism which he admired. Yet he was an original poet because, though he imitated that realism, it was naturally suited to the character of his own mind. He was a realist because the subject matter of his poetry, his religion, absorbed the whole of his life. Everything he saw or felt or did seemed to him, because it had a religious significance for him, a fit subject for his verse. And so his verse, though much of it is not poetry, is nearly all interesting. In his youth, a courtier, though afterwards an Anglican clergyman of the most devout life, he was always more of a man of the world and more interested in other men than any other of the fantastic poets except Marvel. Exacting from himself an extreme piety, he could yet make allowances for the worldly preoccupations of others, and his poem Perirantarium, or The Church Porch, preaches a wisdom half religious, half worldly, which is intended to smooth the way from the world to the church. Yet in his wisdom there is no sordid compliance with worldly aims. Herbert's object is not to show that the saint prospers better than the sinner, but rather to express a heavenly philosophy in earthly terms and he produces a series of aphorisms of extraordinary pregnancy and wit, as, for instance, quote, Pick out of tales the mirth, but not the sin. He pears his apple that will cleanly feed. God gave thy soul brave wings. Put not those feathers into a bed to sleep out all ill weathers. Who keeps no guard upon himself is slack, and rots to nothing at the next great thaw. End quote. Saying like these are not exactly poetry, yet they could not be put so tersely in prose. As a matter of literary history, it may be noticed that they are the beginnings of the prosaic verse of the eighteenth century, of the verse which aims not at the beautiful expression of emotion, but at the witty expression of facts or ideas. And this same tendency shows itself in Herbert's poem of the Church Militant, which is a kind of historical essay in verse, full of philosophic ideas, such as no Elizabethan would have entertained, and expressed often with admirable though laboring wit. 
The poem, indeed, is much nearer in spirit to Pope's essay on man than to any Elizabethan verse. It is true that Pope, living in an age more familiar with general ideas and with controversies, has far more tact than Herbert in dealing with them. He knows exactly when to illustrate them with an image and when to state them directly. Herbert, like all writers of his time, can scarcely express a general idea except through an image. The poetic habits of writers accustomed only to treat of emotions and their objects still cling to him. And the main result of his anxiety to speak plainly and simply is an indifference about the associations of the images which he uses. Yet that very anxiety, though tactless and clumsy compared with Pope's art, is also more honest and significant. He was a poet writing in an age of great poetry, and his wit is often rather hampered or suppressed poetry than a mere play of the intellect. He has a curious and half-modern idea of the manner in which both Christian righteousness and pagan sin have adapted themselves to the characters of different ages and countries. Sin in Greece, he says, quote, became a poet and would serve his spills of sublimate in that conserve, end quote and he expresses the change of morality from Republican Greece and Rome to Imperial Rome very tersely and profoundly in this further couplet on the adaptation of sin. Quote, Glory was his chief instrument of old. Pleasure succeeded straight when that grew cold. End quote. Lines like these reveal a habit of philosophic meditation upon the course of history which was then quite new to English poetry. And this habit of philosophic meditation, this kind of criticism of mankind as a whole, is to be found also in Marvel, and also, as was remarked before, in a poet so inferior as Habington. But Herbert is best known for his personal poems of religion, and they best display his genius. Some of them, of course, are trivial, mere formal puzzles and exercises of barren wit, such as his age retaining some medieval childishness of intellect with all its new interest and ideas still delighted in. But at his best he writes of his unworldly hopes and fears, his ecstasies and shortcomings, with the same mixture of realism and passion that inspires the love poems of Don. He wrote, as Don wrote, to express his own individual experiences, to explain himself to himself. He was, like many other imaginative and pious writers, troubled and perplexed by the fact that he could not stay always at the same pitch of delight in holiness. Quote, how should I praise thee, Lord? How should my rhymes gladly engrave thy love in steel, if what my soul doth feel sometimes my soul might ever feel? Although there were some forty heavens or more, sometimes I peer above them all, sometimes I hardly reach a score, sometimes to hell I fall." End quote. Here the poetic temperament begins to criticize and to analyze itself. Here is an early instance of that modern impatience with the physical infirmities of the human imagination which was to produce so many poetic laments in the 19th century. Herbert, however, like most poets when they try to understand themselves, has only half managed to do so. He notes the unevenness of his moods, but imputes it to the infirmities of his soul, not of his body. He lived in an age which was critical, both of itself and of the universe, but whose criticisms all took a religious form, to which all folly and infirmity appeared as sin, and all wisdom and strength as righteousness and in which one kind of philosophy of life expressed itself as Calvinism, another as Roman Catholicism, and yet another as Anglicanism. Herbert was an Anglican, 
trying to find a middle way of orderly freedom and sweetness and light between what seemed to him two dark contending spiritual despotisms. He wished himself and all other men to be in immediate communion with God, and he also labored to prove that God was loving and kindly, and that a high and reasonable joy must be the noblest result of communion with him. His poems are records of an unceasing effort to attain that joy, which came to him only fitfully, as it must come to all men of eager and searching imagination. And his inspiration was as fitful as his joy, for he would not force it, would not pretend to be in a poetic rapture when his devotion had strained itself into morbid misgivings and searchings of heart. And for that very reason, his beauties, when they come, are the more moving. The reader knows that they have been achieved at a great cost, that they express a spiritual joy which is the issue of a long spiritual conflict. Nowhere in our literature is the tired yet happy tranquillity which may come to a noble mind long vexed with its own terrors more finely expressed than in Herbert's poem of the flower. Quote, and now, in age, I bud again. After so many deaths, I live and write. I once more smell the dew and rain and relish versing. Oh, my only light, it cannot be that I am he on whom thy tempests fell all night. End quote. Herbert had many imitators, for there were many men in his age who thought and felt as he did, yet who lacked his original genius. But the chief of his imitators was also an original poet of a genius very different from his own. Henry Vaughan, 1621 or 22 to 1695, was a Welshman of whose secluded life very little is known. Like Herbert, he was an Anglican. And like Herbert, he often expressed his own spiritual shortcomings and misgivings in his poetry. Yet he seems to do this mainly because Herbert did it. His most original poems are much more abstract and more immediately concerned with beauty than Herbert's. Vaughan, indeed, is most remarkable for his treatment of nature, a treatment quite novel in his own day and anticipating the treatment of Wordsworth, Shelley, and other poets of the 19th century. Yet it was the religious earnestness of his age, working upon a natural delight in the beauties of nature, which led Vaughan to see a new significance in these beauties. He, like Herbert, was anxious to find links between earth and heaven, to reconcile things terrestrial with things celestial, and, as Shelley scanned the world for hints and symbols of that idea of beauty of which his heart was set, as Wordsworth felt and labored to express a growing intimacy between the soul of man and the beauties of nature, so Vaughan found in those beauties both an assurance of the goodness of God and an image of his mysteries. The Elizabethans saw in them only ornaments to the life of man and external images of human beauty. Nature, for them, has no independent life of its own. It suggests comparisons, but not ideas. But in Vaughan's poetry, it ceases to be an ornament. It becomes mysterious and significant of things outside the life of man, because he recognizes in it symbols of beauties and mysteries which the mind of man is incapable of comprehending. Vaughan never consciously expresses such a doctrine of the independence of nature as later poets have expressed, yet his poetry is filled with unconscious expressions of that independence. He can write thus, for instance, of a fallen tree, quote, Sure thou didst flourish once, and many springs, many bright mornings, much dew, many showers passed o'er thy head, many light hearts and wings, which now are dead, lodged in thy living bowers. 
True, the poem goes on to trace a rather fanciful connection between the tree and a murdered man, yet its real inspiration comes from Vaughn's sense of the tree as something to be loved and pitied like a human being. And this sense came to him because he was wont to look for a kind of soul in natural things, for a life as significant of the divine mysteries which engrossed his mind as the life of man. Thus his images derived from nature have a new simplicity and profundity. They are as natural and as mysterious as the things from which they are taken. He speaks, for instance, of man before the fall as, quote, All naked, innocent and bright, and intimate with heaven as light. End quote. His own poetry from his communion with nature has that same intimacy with the divine, for it was through nature that he gazed upon and seemed to pierce the secrets beyond nature. Quote, he that hath found some fledged bird's nest may know at first sight if the bird be flown. But what fair dell or grove he sings in now, that is to him unknown. End quote. In childhood, as in nature, he found a revelation of divine things, and the most beautiful of all his poems anticipates and is said to have suggested Wordsworth's intimations of immortality. Another poet, Thomas Treharne, whose works have only lately been given to the world by fortune and discovery, made much of his poetry out of that theme. Treharne, who was born perhaps in 1630 and died in 1674, was an Anglican clergyman, and perhaps a Welshman like Vaughan. His life, like Vaughan's, appears to have been secluded and uneventful. His poems, though full of quiet beauty, never reach the heights attained sometimes by Herbert or Vaughan, but they are remarkable for the persistency with which they work out certain ideas, such as that of the remembrance of heavenly things in childhood. English minor poets have never been so much preoccupied with ideas as in the 17th century, or at least have never held them with so much conviction or applied them so consistently to their lives. Treharne appears, both from his poems and from extracts published from his prose Centuries of Meditations, to have been more of a philosopher than either Herbert or Vaughan and philosophic ideas are developed in his verse with a closeness of reasoning which sometimes hampers his inspiration. The object of all his arguments is to prove that connection between earth and heaven which so absorbed the minds of Herbert and Vaughan. Like them, he is an unworldly poet who will not write of the lust of the eye and the pride of life, who pursues his own private meditations and seeks his own spiritual joy remote from other men. But Treharne had neither Herbert's knowledge of life and intensity of experience, nor Vaughan's prophetic sympathy with nature. He deals more with abstractions than either of them. In argument he is their superior, but he is their inferior in poetry. Richard Crashaw began as an Anglican poet like Herbert, Vaughan, and Treharne. He was, indeed, the son of an Anglican clergyman. He was born, perhaps, in 1616, and was educated at the Charter House and at Pembroke Hall, Cambridge. He was ejected from his fellowship at Peterhouse in 1644 because he would not subscribe to the Covenant. After this he became a Roman Catholic and went to Paris, where Cui rescued him from destitution. He went to Italy and died at Loreto, where he is said, though this seems more than doubtful, to have been appointed to a canonry about 1650. There is something in all Crashaw's poetry more congruous with Roman Catholicism than with Anglicanism. He is not, like Herbert or Don, a critic of life, a searcher of his own heart. He does not argue. He has no anxiety to justify the ways of God to man. 
he does not look with curious, wistful eyes, like Vaughn, upon the beauties of the earth. His gaze is set upon visionary celestial glories. His ecstasies are troubled by no misgivings. He is, in fact, like Shelley, one of those purely lyrical poets whom English literature produces now and then, and who are always rebels against the current English ideas of their day. For the English love of compromise and submission to existing facts are repellent to that lyrical temperament which times of revolution are apt to produce in England like a kind of glorious freak. Just as extreme continental ideas of liberty inspired Shelley, so Crashaw was inspired by Spanish and Italian extremes of faith. And as the later poet's interest was rather in freedom as an abstraction than in any practical politics, so Crashaw was not concerned with the means by which men may come to a certain trust in the goodness of God, or by those by which they may apply that trust to all their dealings with the world. His aim was only to express the raptures of a faith which he assumes as an instinct. He is the poet of saints and martyrs, of, quote, the heirs elect of love, whose names belong unto the everlasting life of song, end quote. Indeed, he conceives of righteousness not like Herbert as a troubled and anxious thing picking its way through the darkness of doubt and error, but simply as a, quote, everlasting life of song, end quote, a state of abstract joy insensible to the delights and threats of the world. This conception he derived, no doubt, from the great Spanish mystics, especially from St. Teresa, to whose, quote, name and honor, end quote, he dedicated one of the greatest pieces of lyrical poetry in our literature. He wrote it while still an Anglican, for when he had become a Roman Catholic, he made an apology for its shortcomings, in which he says, quote, Oh, pardon if I dare to say, thy own dear books are guilty, for from thence I learned to know that love is eloquence. Crashaw, in fact, is one of the least English of our great poets. More than any of our fantastic poets, he was infected with the conceits of the fantastic poets of Italy, especially Marino, one book of whose Stragi degli Innocenti he translated into verse alternately splendid and absurd. The extent to which Don or Herbert were influenced by Italian poets is doubtful. Wit was fashionable in English poetry before the time of Marino, and the wit of Don is an essential part of the process of his own thought. He thinks naturally in violent and ingenious images and analogies. So too does Herbert, though he, like Crashaw, was certainly influenced by the Spanish mystics. But there is no doubt of the influence of Italian poets upon Crashaw. His conceits are usually mere ornaments taken from them and from Don and Herbert, and they are often very incongruous ornaments. For he was really a poet of pure emotion, and his natural means of expression were a lyrical beauty of rhythm and sound, and not any novelty or profundity of thought. His thought is always simple, and in his finest verse it is simply expressed. When he writes badly, and he often writes very badly indeed, it is nearly always because he is aiming at a wit unnatural to his way of thinking. And yet the ambition of wit, the desire to enrich his emotions with the play of his intellect, sometimes inspires him with imaginative epigrams unparalleled in our later lyrical poetry, as when he enumerates the marvels of the Incarnation, concluding with the marvel, quote, That glory's self should serve our griefs and fears, and free eternity submit to years, end quote. In strokes such as this he combines the searching, exacting thought of Herbert or Don with his own lyrical fire, just as Shelley sometimes in Adonais turned a later philosophy into music. 
Both of these poets, in fact, were lyrists of great universal emotions. Yet both were children of their own age, and got substance and force both from the ideas of their age and from their rebellion against certain of those ideas. Cooley, the friend and benefactor of Crashaw, was born in 1618 and educated at Westminster and Trinity College, Cambridge. Like Crashaw, he was expelled from his fellowship and in 1646 went to Paris to the court of Henrietta Maria. He died in 1667, having returned to England at the Restoration. Cooley was once esteemed the chief of the fantastic poets. He has lost that eminence because, with all his ingenuity and pleasant fancies, he was only half a poet by nature, and certainly not a fantastic poet. Indeed, he was one of the first writers of that prosaic kind of poetry which became the rule in the 18th century. Yet the great poetic conventions which still persisted in his time influenced him enough to make him write usually against his nature. Like Crashaw, he was misled into the use of ornaments incongruous with his ideas, though incongruous for different reasons. For whereas Crashaw was too poetic for his conceits, Cooley was too prosaic. Cooley was always straining himself to give expression to an imagination which he did not possess and to emotions stronger than those which were really his. The loose, rhymed verse which suited Crashaw's genius so well was in his hands only the irregular instrument of very well-regulated passions. His intellect is exercised in all his poetry, but often to little purpose, because it attempts to do the work of the emotions. His conceits are the contortions of a mind that cannot think itself into a frenzy. Cooley, in fact, was one of the costly failures of a time of transition. He had the ideas of an age to come, which he tried to express in the manner of an age that was passing away. He was an essayist at heart, who made it his chief business to write verses, and his best poems are those which philosophize quietly about the quiet pleasures which he most enjoyed. Andrew Marvel, the only one of the great fantastic poets who sympathized with the Puritans, was also a philosophic versifier of simple pleasures, and a link between the more extreme fantastic poets and the prosaic poets who came into vogue after the Restoration. Marvel was born in 1621 and educated at Trinity College, Cambridge. He was tutor to the daughter of Lord Fairfax and assistant to Milton in his secretaryship to Cromwell. After Cromwell's death, he became member of Parliament for Hull and was active in opposition to the abuses of Charles II's government until his death in 1678. He was therefore a man of affairs, and his poetry was the diversion of a man of affairs who also happened to be a poet. It is usually free from the worst excesses of the fantastic poets. It is not usually religious. It often deals with subjects most commonly treated in prose. Yet, for all that, Marvel was one of the great fantastic poets. He has their intensity of laboring thought, their command of ideas, and their critical and analytical spirit. He, like Don, is a master of, quote, things extreme and scattering bright, end quote, and he produces them with less appearance of labor. He is the only one of the fantastic poets who has the tact to trifle imaginatively or rather to kindle his imagination on trifles, and his wit is more easily enjoyed today than the wit of the others because of the extraordinary skill with which he can transfer it from small to great matters. The lines to his coy mistress, which pass from witty trifling to witty sublimity, are the best example of this unique power. Marvel, in fact, was more reconciled to the world than the other fantastic poets, 
he tries to express no extremes of righteousness or passion, but rather to make the best of life as it is, and to show what mystery and beauty there are in common things. Thus he resembles Vaughan somewhat in his treatment of nature, except that he writes with the careless tenderness of a man of affairs for whom the enjoyment of nature is only a diversion. He expresses the subsidence of all that revolutionary confusion and turmoil which troubled the poetry of his predecessors so deeply. He is deeply troubled, but with actual events, not with his own ideas and passions. And his troubles are expressed in his satires, which are not fantastic poetry at all. Yet his poetry is enriched with the last echoes of the great conflict of ideas. He is not a strainer after infinity himself, yet he is the master of an art exercised in straining after infinity. And there is a sense of infinity, a command of great ideas, a strangeness of beauty in his Horatian Ode, and even in his trifles. The fantastic poetry, when he sets it to deal with familiar themes such as children or gardens, has an almost pathetic charm, as of a wanderer come back from ranging over the world, whose delight in his own house and fireside is quickened and enriched by memories of all the wonders and terrors he has seen. There is a kind of domesticated audacity in his imagination, which makes him the true poet of the transition from poetry to prose. The discords of that transition sound like strange harmonies in his verse. He tamed the fantastic poetry and taught it common sense. But he did not teach it not to be poetry. That task remained for writers such as Dryden, who, belonging to an age weary of spiritual conflict and mystery, discredited the fantastic poetry by sheer parody of its style, before they superseded it with a new kind of verse formed to express new and clear but less profound ideas. End of section 81Section 82 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 27. Descartes and Cartesianism by Émile Boutroux. Part 1. The period of continental history, which extends from the beginning of the Thirty Years' War to the Peace of the Pyrenees, is, from the point of view of intellectual progress, chiefly noteworthy for the works of Descartes and for the growing influence of the Cartesian philosophy. Descartes was a Frenchman. Now, he traveled over the whole of Europe. He lived for twenty years in Holland. He was connected with numerous learned men of different countries, and among his pupils were a princess Palatine and a queen of Sweden. To some extent, therefore, he represents the whole of Europe, which, moreover, even in his lifetime, displayed a fervent partisanship for or against his philosophy. At the beginning of the 17th century, France, where Descartes passed his days of studentship, presented in the world of thought a spectacle of disorder and confusion. The instruction given in the colleges was still wholly scholastic. But in the field of philosophy, the yoke of authority had been cast off since the time of Raimu and the Renaissance. The philosophy of Aristotle was being rejected, and no substitute could be offered in its place except some other system likewise borrowed from the ancients, such as Neoplatonism, Platonism, Epicureanism, or Stoicism. On the other hand, learning enlisted fewer enthusiasts than in the 16th century, and philology was in its decadence. 
The work of the Renaissance, so far as philosophy was concerned, seemed to be chiefly negative and drew a number of thinkers towards skepticism. And, from the religious standpoint, there was not less cause for anxiety in the prevailing condition of mind. Side by side with the development of medieval doctrine from the 15th century onwards, a struggle had manifested itself between faith and reason, which was wholly adverse to the scholastic point of view. On the other hand, the Reformation had, with incomparable force, reawakened the craving for a personal and living way of belief and thought, as opposed to mere repetition of formulae and of comment upon them. And this movement had not been confined to the Protestants. Towards the middle of the 16th century, the Catholic Church had also experienced its renaissance of faith and religious life. The celebrated Society of Jesus, which was afterwards so dangerously to confound the policy of man with the service of God, had, in the words of its founder, Ignatius de Loyola, been actually instituted with the object of awakening in men's souls, by means of appropriate exercises, the Christian faith and Christian love. Now, even if an abstract philosophical treatise can sustain side by side doctrines mutually opposed without any interference of the one with the other, the living human conscience cannot for long endure such an antagonism. Thus all thoughtful men were perturbed by the struggle between faith and reason which had caused the moral revolution of the sixteenth century, whilst, on the other hand, the frivolous were provided with arguments in favor of incredulity. Moreover, side by side with philosophy and theology, a new power was developing which would infallibly claim a share in the guidance of man's mind. This was the science of nature. Hitherto the earth had been regarded as the center of the world, but Copernicus had recently assigned this place of honor to the sun, about 1604, Galileo, by the discovery of the laws of gravitation and of the pendulum, had proved it possible to explain the phenomena of nature by comparing them with one another, while stating natural laws and avoiding any recourse to mysterious forces and influences. What would be the effect of this scientific revolution when man came to examine its bearings on philosophy? In this intellectual atmosphere, in which antagonistic elements were at variance with one another, a class of men, frivolous, skeptical, impatient of all restraint, who claimed the right to think and live according to their individual inspiration, was continually on the increase. These were the free thinkers. They took their inspiration from Montaigne, appropriating in particular his critical and negative conclusions. They were represented by some very prominent men. Cesare Vanini, a young Neapolitan priest who acknowledged no other god but nature. Théophile de Vieux, a worldly poet, quote, head of the secret atheists, end quote, and close to the throne. Gaston of Orléans, brother of Louis XIII, who wrote lampoons on God and his sovereign in verse. Such, in general, was the chaotic state of men's minds. However, a very different age was at the same time announcing itself. While Richelieu was re-establishing in society the principle of order and authority, it was natural that a similar change should take place in the world of thought. Now, ever since the end of the 16th century, Malherbe had been subjecting the poetry, versification, and overloaded style of the Renaissance to the laws of clearness, purity, method, and good taste. And from 1620 onwards, the Hôtel de Rambouillet, where particular attention was paid to purity of style, fostered the idea of the French Academy, which was actually established in 1635. Soon, in 1636, there burst forth with the suddenness of a thunderbolt a masterpiece in which were blended to perfection 
youthful enthusiasm and scrupulous obedience to rule, the Cid of Pierre Corneille. A desire for order and stability was therefore beginning to make itself felt, and it is to be noticed that man sought for the principles of such order, not in the authority of any established law, but in the supreme right of common sense, truth, and reason. In 1540, Calvin had published his Institution Chrétienne in French, with a view to attracting the simple as well as the learned to the individual religious life. In the hands of Montaigne from 1580, the French language had become more pliant, more capable of expressing in a simple and picturesque way the subtle thoughts of philosophy, and thus men of the world were enabled to examine questions formally reserved for scholars. All these tendencies, both positive and negative, are united in Descartes, whose work, suggestive and far-reaching, though severely methodical, was at the same time the complete realization of the thought of his epoch and the starting point of future developments. René Descartes, 1596-1650, was born at La Haye in Touraine on March 31, 1596. His family belonged to the Petite Noblesse and came originally from Poitou. From 1604 to 1612, he was a pupil at the Jesuit College of La Flèche. Then he spent two years, 1615 to 16, at the University of Poitiers, where he took his bachelor's and afterwards his licentiate's degree in civil and canon law. In 1617, he entered the service of Prince Maurice of Nassau in Holland as a volunteer, about the same time, he was studying the principles of music, algebra, and science. He was justifying the nickname given him by his father, who from his childhood had called him the Little Philosopher. Then, in 1619, when war threatened in Germany, he went to that country, was present at the coronation of the Emperor Ferdinand II at Frankfurt, and enlisted in the Duke of Bavaria's forces. He spent the winter in the duchy of Neuburg, where he remained all day shut up in his little room, untroubled by cares and passions, free to devote himself to meditation. It was then that he fell into a sort of trance of enthusiasm, in the midst of which, so he tells us, he discovered the principles of a wonderful science, and, in order to secure the help of the Blessed Virgin in this undertaking, he vowed to make a pilgrimage to Our Lady of Loreto. In 1620 he was with the army in Bohemia, and in 1621 in Hungary. Then he abandoned the profession of arms, which he had regarded mainly as a means towards the study of his fellow men, and came back to France by way of northern Germany and Holland. From 1622 to 1625, he traveled again in France, in Switzerland, and in Italy. From 1625 to 1629, he stayed for the last time in Paris. Then, having been entreated by his friends to publish some portion of his works, he withdrew to Holland, hoping, in the healthy climate of that well-governed state, to meet with conditions of life more favorable to meditation than he had found in France. He remained in Holland until September 5, 1649, but while there, in order to escape from interference, he frequently changed his place of abode, and during this period he made several journeys, one of which is said to have been to England, 1631. In Holland he composed his great works, Meditaciones de Prima Filosofia, which was not published till 1641, twelve years after it had been written, Le Monde ou Traité de la Lumière, which he decided not to publish on account of the condemnation pronounced on Galileo, 1633, whose opinion as to the motion of the earth coincided with Descartes' own. Le Discours de la Méthode, with La Dioptrique, Les Meteors et la Géométrie, attempts to exemplify his method, in 1637, 
Principia Philosophiae in 1644 and Le Traité des Passions de l'Âme in 1649. At the same time, he was in correspondence with several learned men, with his friend Father Mersenne, who formed the center of scientific correspondence, with Fermat and Robert Val, and, as his philosophy had spread rapidly throughout the Dutch universities and had excited much opposition among the Aristotelians, he defended himself and his doctrines against his antagonists and enemies. Among his pupils were Princess Elizabeth, daughter of the Elector Palatine Frederick V and of the English Princess Elizabeth, and afterwards Queen Christina of Sweden. The latter entreated him to come to her court and sent a ship to Amsterdam in order to convey him. After some hesitation, Descartes yielded, largely in the hope that he might serve the cause of the Princess Elizabeth in Stockholm, but the winter climate of Sweden proved too severe for him, and he died at Stockholm February 11, 1650. He was only in his 55th year. In addition to his published works, he left several manuscripts, which were gradually brought to light. These included, in the first place, a voluminous correspondence, then a Traité de l'Homme et de la Formation du Fœtus, 1664, Le Monde ou Traité de la Lumière, 1664, with the Regulae ad Directionem Ingenii, 1701, a work probably composed between 1619 and 1629. The most salient characteristic of the author of the Discours de la Méthode is his restless and independent disposition. This philosopher is an aristocrat of an adventurous disposition, a worthy contemporary of the heroes of the Thirty Years' War. One day, Gassendi apostrophized him with a taunt, O oh, mens! But, as a matter of fact, few men have seen so many countries or have so ardently longed to come in contact with reality. At the same time, he is impatient of any kind of restraint, whether material or intellectual. Throughout all his struggles and adventures, he endeavors to retain his serenity of thought. He would like his motto to be Bene qui latuit, bene vixit. Descartes is the very reverse of a philosopher of the schools. Nothing seems alien to him. Philosophy is a part of his daily life, no less on the battlefield than when he is solving a problem of geometry. And his philosophy has practical purposes which are constantly before his eyes. He considers that those who do not work for the good of their fellow men are essentially worthless. Hence it follows naturally that he is dissatisfied with ready-made doctrines which can be proved or rejected by means of an abstract system of dialectics. He is in quest of living certainties, of doctrines which will satisfy his spiritual needs. The only truth which he is prepared to acknowledge is that which he has, to some extent, reconstituted by the activity of his own reason. And his diction, so wonderfully clear, correct, and logical, merely translates into words the inner working of his mind. In Descartes' life, philosophy, science, and the art of writing, which hitherto had usually been isolated, are reunited and form an indissoluble whole. Hence the original force and the significance of his personality. To define his point of view with regard to life and its phenomena means to trace the history of his mind. Among the scientific subjects studied by him at the College of La Flèche, there was one to which he felt especially attracted, and which made him unduly critical of the rest, viz. mathematics. This science brought logical reasons to support what it affirmed, and therefore afforded him intellectual certainty. Compared with mathematics, all other sciences, such as language, history, jurisprudence, medicine, philosophy, ethics, were mere exercises of memory or of abstract dialectics, 
and incapable of supplying irrefutable conclusions. To Descartes, it seemed that information which brought with it no certainty had no claim to the title of science. He therefore first came forward with mathematical researches. Herein he succeeded so well that he formed the highest idea of the power and capability of this science, and, realizing that hitherto it had merely been made serviceable to the mechanical arts, he asked himself, why, seeing that its foundations were so firm and solid, no more important structure had been raised upon them. Thus he conceived the idea of treating, according to the mathematical method, not merely numbers and figures, but concrete realities, in other words, of applying the mathematical method to philosophy. But this application could not be legitimately made unless the method were rendered more general by divesting it of the peculiarities which belong to the special purpose of mathematics. In order to enable himself to effect this, Descartes determined to develop in himself the sense of truth, the critical faculty, and the power of solid argument. With this end in view, he devoted long years to the solution of mathematical problems and to reflection on the operations of the mind involved in this work. Thus was very gradually brought out the point of view which is characteristic of his line of speculation, and which places him so high in the study of human thought. In every branch of knowledge, in all the sciences, however exact they may be, he marked out in an ultimate analysis the human understanding as their common support, their source, and their final criterion. And he placed the mainspring of all knowledge not in a given dogma, fact, or proposition, but in the mind of man, trained by a suitable education to discern the truth. Bonamens sive universalissima sapientia, we read at the beginning of the Regulae. And at the end of the Discours de la Méthode, Descartes explains that he has written in French rather than in Latin, trusting that those who depend on their unsophisticated natural reasoning faculty will be better qualified to criticize his opinions than those who only place their faith in ancient books. The evidence acknowledged by honest reason is in all cases the supreme criterion of truth. This reason, moreover, can never become for a man a complete and finite thing, replaceable by a formula. We must unceasingly exercise, strengthen, and extend it by supplying it with truths, for activity is its being. This is the principle which regulated the intellectual occupations and the doctrines of Descartes. As a born mathematician, he could not fail to apply himself with zeal to a science then so flourishing. As is known, Analytical geometry, that is, algebra applied to geometry, dates from the Essai de Géométrie, published by him in 1637, immediately after his Discours de la Méthode. It must, however, be admitted that this discovery would, in any case, have, sooner or later, followed on those in analysis due to Viette. What is wholly original in the mathematical work of Descartes is his complete recasting of the theory of equations and the general solution given by him to the problem of tangents for algebraical curves. Descartes was not only a mathematician but also a physicist. The discoveries of Galileo determined him to seek to improve the telescope. With this end in view, he investigated the mathematical law of refraction and in order to decide on the shapes of the lenses, he studied the problem of tangents. Soon afterwards he applied himself to the general subject of light, and applied his principles to the explanation of the phenomenon of the rainbow. And he thus arrived at the conception of a complete revolution in the whole science of physics, in the widest sense of the word. This consisted in substituting everywhere purely mathematical explanations for the scholastic formulae assuming occult influences. 
but this step could not be taken simply by the application of principles proper to mathematical science. How could it be asserted that the nature of bodies could be fully expressed in mathematical terms? In order to solve this problem, Descartes plunged into metaphysical speculation. He sought, by the light of reasonable evidence, some truth which would enable him to prove the principles not only of mathematics or the science of what may be, but of philosophy or the science of what is. He finds this principle in the proposition cogito ergo sum, inasmuch as it applies such an association of an essence with an existence as appears to the reason indissoluble in fact, if not by right. Starting with this positive but contingent existence, he, by examining that idea of the perfect being which he finds in the mind of man, arrives at the existence of God, and he shows that the fact of this existence is laid down by reason, no longer as hypothetical but as a logical necessity, and from the existence of God he proceeds by argument to that of material things, but at the same time he shows that the only sense in which this can be held to be proved is that which regards all material bodies as in themselves mere modifications of geometrical extension. Physics, therefore, can and must be treated altogether from a geometrical standpoint, and this is precisely quod erat demonstrandum. In accordance with the practical rule which he had made for himself, and which consisted in devoting the greater part of his time to the recreation of the senses, and a very small portion of it to the exercise of the pure understanding, within a few months Descartes succeeded in establishing the principles of his metaphysics. In order to make sure of the strength of the work, he thought it necessary and sufficient that this work should have been the genuine product of free reason, disentangled from sense and imagination. In fact, though the meditation is but small in bulk, its doctrinal matter is large, and the book is great by its originality and by its importance. First, it demonstrates the method known as that of methodic doubt, which consists in the provisional rejection of all that knowledge which, when examined from the standpoint of pure reason, appears uncertain. In the second place, by means of the proposition of cogito ergo sum, it defines that knowledge which, by its own action, the mind has established as primary and fundamental knowledge, inasmuch as no knowledge has any value for us unless it rationally connects itself with the knowledge which we have of our own existence. But if we admit that rational evidence is the sole criterion of certainty, the important consequence necessarily follows that those kinds of knowledge which depend upon the evidence of such witnesses as history or positive theology can never become sciences in the exact meaning of the word. The soul is defined by thought, the body by extension, since these two attributes are the only ones of which we can form a clear idea. Hence, all the other properties of being, such as sentiment and will, which are produced in the mind, or concrete qualities and passions which manifest themselves in the body, have to be regarded merely as moods, either of thought or extension. And the actual fact of the union of soul and body is, so far as science is concerned, solely a confused medley of essences which cannot be simplified, but must be dissociated from each other. The existence of God can no longer be demonstrated by considering the nature of the world. On the contrary, it must be recognized before we have the right to speak of the existence of material things. Descartes attempts to find the starting point for the demonstration of the existence of God in our own existence and in the content of our reason. The latter, according to him, contains innate germs which, by force of meditation, 
grow and are evolved into clear and distinct ideas. One of these ideas is that of God or of the perfect being. A careful consideration of this idea enables the understanding to perceive clearly that, differing from all others, it involves the existence of its object. From our reason is likewise derived the idea of extension, by the help of which we can conceive of the existence of something external to ourselves. Now, the senses, for their part, represent to us objects which, among other qualities, possess that of extension. The knowledge of a perfect God, the author of reason and senses alike, transforms into a rational belief our natural tendency to believe that our sensations proceed from corporeal things which actually exist. Consequently, it permits us to reduce all the qualities of bodies to extension, which alone can clearly be conceived, and which is therefore alone, in the eyes of reason, capable of existence. From these metaphysical principles proceed the celebrated physical theories of Descartes. No explanation by final causes is received in the science of nature. For mathematics admit only the mechanical relations between component and composed. The world has been evolved mechanically from chaos, matter having, in the course of time, automatically taken all possible forms, only those being retained which, according to the general laws of motion, offered adequate conditions of equilibrium and stability. In order to account in this way for the formation of the world, Descartes lays down as a principle the permanency of the same quantity of motion in the universe, and he holds that all motion is transmitted by impact. Moreover, he invents the celebrated hypothesis of vortices, according to which each body is surrounded by numerous particles of matter, arranged in spherical layers, which revolve continually about it as round a common center. This mechanical theory of the formation of the solar system formed the prelude to that which Kant and Laplace were afterwards to enunciate with so much success. All the properties of bodies, in so far as they belong to the things themselves, and are not merely the illusory projections of our inner feelings, are nothing but extension and motion in space. Thought or reason alone, which are the necessary conditions of the knowledge of extension of bodies, are of a different character. Beings devoid of reason, however much their actions may seem to be to the purpose, are to scientific insight mere machines. An animal is but a very complicated clock. In man, however, we see that thought and extension are substantially united. This union manifests itself by means of the influence upon each other of soul and body. In certain conditions, the soul can affect the direction, though not the quality, of motion. The influence of the body on the soul is illustrated by the passions, which can only be studied from a scientific point of view when referred to their bodily cause. From these metaphysical and physical principles, Descartes by no means concludes that any object whatever can become known a priori without the aid of experience. In explaining the creation of the world out of initial chaos, he had merely presented his conclusions in the light of a hypothesis, the total value of which consisted in its conformity with observable phenomena. In proportion as he treats of more complicated phenomena, he assigns a greater and more necessary part to experiment and to Baconian induction. And the celebrated Discours de la Méthode ends with an appeal to the generosity of the friends of science, soliciting their aid for the author in the costly experiments which he is obliged to undertake in order to work, as his ambition impels him to work, for the progress of physiology and of medicine. The mathematics, physics, and biology of Descartes 
have one important feature in common. They are as profound as it seemed possible to the philosopher to make them, but they are restricted to the study of a few fundamental problems and have no pretensions to be complete. The mind of Descartes was, in fact, firmly fixed upon what was to him the very principle and object of philosophy, namely reason as the standard of truth, and, at the same time, a power which it is our duty to develop by a culture. And the sciences are the instruments of this culture. According to Descartes, it is through them that either man will acquire a control over nature, on which the liberty of reason is conditional, or the formation of reason itself be achieved. But he only asks of the sciences that which is necessary and sufficient for reaching this twofold end. Thus, in the end, his philosophy leads to the practical applications, which, by means of the theoretical sciences, teach man to realize the work of reason. These applications are, in the first place, mechanics, or the appropriation by man of the forces of nature, next, medicine, or the care for the health of the body, on which that of the soul is so largely dependent, and finally, ethics, or the determination by reason of the objects to be selected by the will of man, and the choice of means suitable for calming or subduing the passions, and for creating a virtual disposition in the soul. According to Descartes, the will has for its ends the love of God and the interest of the whole of which the individual is a part. And the surest way to reach these ends is to attain to a clear and exact knowledge of things, because a luminous understanding generates a strong desire in the will. Such is the philosophy of Descartes, which may be said to have re-established order and certainty in the human mind. As viewed by Descartes, science, experience of life, the principles of religious faith, and the good sense of a well-bred man do not merely exist side by side, they cooperate in forming a harmonious whole. Taken by themselves, apart from the mind which sustains them, and considered from an abstract point of view, science, religion, and life may seem in opposition, even in contradiction to each other. With Descartes, however, they find a common basis in philosophy, which in itself is but the free activity of reason, just as the most widely divergent branches of the same tree are nourished by the same roots. Reason is no longer the empty form to which the dialecticians of the school had confined it, but contains positive and innate principles. If these be developed by culture and meditation, reason draws from them the elementary ideas of science, together with the essential truths of religion. And these principles, which are at the same time universal, inspiring, and productive, are nothing but good sense, freed from prejudices and deepened in the process. By means of this doctrine, philosophy grew to be of great importance. It was the necessary mediating power between religion, science, and life, and was to accomplish this important function not by surpassing the other sciences in obscurity and pedantry, but, on the contrary, by assuming the standpoint of the well-bred man towards scholastic subtleties, and by speaking simply and clearly in the common tongue. In short, as understood to consist in the culture of reason, in Descartes' conception of this word, philosophy had become the basis of every branch of knowledge, and had been secularized once for all. End of section 82《セクション83 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 27 — Descartes and Cartesianism by Émile Bautroux, Part 2 
As is the case with all works that are essentially original, the meaning and importance of Descartes' philosophy were but inadequately appreciated by his contemporaries. However, such vigorous and productive thought could not fail to excite immediate attention on every side. Unlike the learned criticism of the Renaissance scholars, it did not content itself with destroying or with exhuming the past, but built afresh on new foundations. Pierre Borel, a contemporary of Descartes, tells us that at the actual time of the master's death, his disciples were as numerous as the stars in the firmament or the grains of sand by the sea. Some of the most celebrated of these were his personal pupils. Among the most distinguished we must place the Princess Palatine Elizabeth. In 1640 she was living at The Hague with her mother, who had taken refuge there. She was a beautiful and haughty princess, a worthy daughter of the house of Stuart, eager to prove herself heroic and magnanimous. When twenty years of age she had refused the crown of Poland so as not to abjure the Protestant faith in which she had been brought up. Meditation was for her the highest happiness. She wished to see the man of whom all Holland was then talking, such had been the interest excited by his essays on their appearance in 1637, and whose works she had read with admiration. At that time Descartes was living in the small castle of Endechaest near Leyden, and only two leagues distant from The Hague. He caused himself to be presented to the Queen of Bohemia, whose salon he found to be wholly Cartesian. Elizabeth received him not only as a master, but as a friend. She had attached herself to the new doctrine, and henceforth adopted its method of seeking to know things clearly and distinctly. Descartes was surprised to find that the mind of this young princess was capable of the most arduous research and of grasping the most sublime truths. In 1644, having already opened a correspondence with her, which was to last six years, 1643-9, to nine, he dedicated to her his Principes. For her part, Elizabeth could not remain satisfied with the abstract theory of the system of the world which formed the conclusion of Descartes' work. She was in great trouble, and her sufferings threatened to undermine her health. She was tried hard by the calamities of her kith and kin. For the cause of the Stuarts seemed to be lost, and in 1649 the head of Charles I was to fall on the scaffold. The sufferings of the Princess Palatine were the more acute in that she was gifted with an especially keen intelligence and with an exceptionally refined sense of morality. She tells Descartes that she realized the inconvenience of being somewhat reasonable. She asked of philosophy a remedy for her misfortunes. She helped to draw the attention of Descartes towards practical questions, to make him consider the passions and to study medicine and ethics by which they may be combated. She conscientiously made trial of the remedies which Descartes proposed to her. But the teaching of the philosopher was essentially optimistic, and the very real sorrows of the princess, her passionate nature, and her melancholy temperament prevented her from finding in this teaching the relief which she sought. At least, however, the Cartesian philosophy in itself continued to arouse her enthusiasm. And when, in 1648, she was obliged to leave The Hague, owing to a murder committed by her brother, she devoted herself to propagating the principles of the Cartesian philosophy in Berlin and Heidelberg. She died in 1680, having been, since 1667, abbess of the Lutheran Abbey of Herford in Westphalia. This rich foundation had been converted by the pupil of Descartes into a free academy, a retreat open to men irrespective of nationality, religion, and opinions, provided only that there were students of philosophy. Another pupil of Descartes was Queen Christina of Sweden, the daughter of Gustavus Adolphus. 
and the relation between them furnishes a striking illustration of the place which science and scientific men then held in the world. Queen Christina was undoubtedly capable and intelligent, but also whimsical, excessively passionate, and addicted to dissipation and license. In 1657, she caused her lover, Monaldeschi, to be assassinated. She was a keen student of languages and science, and drew to her court the learned men of every country. In the interval between presiding at a council of her ministers and writing for ten consecutive hours in a reckless hunt, she dispatched to Descartes, through Chanu, the French ambassador at Stockholm, such queries as the following. What is love? Does the light of nature alone teach us to love God? Which is the worst disorder, that of love or that of hatred? And Descartes replied by a formal dissertation on each of these three heads. Then she sent word to him that she doubts whether the hypothesis of an infinite universe can be admitted without damage to the Christian faith. Or again, having heard at Uppsala an oration on the supreme good pronounced by Professor Freinsheim, she sends to ask Descartes' opinion on the subject. More and more transported by his replies, she wishes to study his principes, desires to see the author, and to receive from him lessons in philosophy. Descartes made up his mind to proceed to Stockholm, where he saw the Queen four or five times in her library at a very early hour in the morning. But the court had at that time little thought for anything but its rejoicings on the conclusion of the Peace of Münster, and as the Queen could not induce Descartes to dance in the ballets, she prevailed upon him to at least write some French verses in honor of the ball. Descartes' ballet was called La Naissance de la Paix. He also wrote a comedy. His sudden death aroused a short-lived sorrow in the Queen. She afterwards pretended that he had played an important part in her glorious conversion, that transition to Catholicism by which she astonished the Pope himself, who was disillusioned at finding in his neophyte a strange freedom of conduct and no sign whatever of a vocation for holiness. Not only Elizabeth and Christina, but also all those who came into contact with Descartes or who read his works were filled with admiration for his genius and became eager students of his philosophy. Throughout all Europe, the advent of his system caused a revolution in the world of thought, exceptional in its force, its extent, and its duration. It would be no easy task to give an account of this revolution of thought, and to follow it in all its manifestations and results. Here it is only possible to add a few instances and indications. Holland was the first battlefield of the Cartesian philosophy. In this land of wealth and freedom, intense intellectual activity prevailed. Descartes was surrounded by friends who interested themselves in his doctrines. Among them were Constantin Huygens, lord of Zuidlichem, father of the great Huygens, and himself a person of no small importance, a counsellor of the Prince of Orange, a statesman, a soldier, and withal a scholar and a man of letters. On the death of Descartes, Huygens apostrophized nature and bade her lead the way in mourning for the great Descartes, the loss of whose life was the loss of her light, for it was by means only of that shed on her by him that man had been able to behold her. Another was van Hoogland, the physician who, following the footsteps of Descartes, sought to solve the problems of medicine through chemistry and mechanics. The influence of Descartes was soon to exceed the narrow limits of Cateries and to make itself felt outside, in the tumultuous sphere of the universities. The first professors to be converted to the Cartesian philosophy in Holland were Henry Rennery and Henry de Roy, otherwise Regius, of the University of Utrecht. The latter became famous on account of his private lectures in medicine and philosophy, 
based on Cartesian principles. He aroused such enthusiasm that in 1638 his pupils united in compelling the university to establish in his favor a second chair of medicine. This was but one year after the publication of the Discours de la Méthode. On the death of Ranery, Regius became chief representative of the new philosophy and vehemently defended it against scholasticism. Thus, in 1641, he caused de Ray, one of his pupils, to sustain a public thesis in which the philosophy and the science of Aristotle were turned to ridicule. Hereupon, war broke out in the university. Each time that a thesis was sustained, it was met by blast and counterblast of applause and hisses. Foremost among the professors of the peripatetic school was the Calvinist minister Hesbert de Thurt, rector of the university, and a bigoted opponent of all new movements. This guardian of orthodoxy had already discountenanced the teaching of the theory of the circulation of the blood. He determined to ruin Descartes. On the one hand, by means of insinuation, he accused him of atheism. On the other, he denounced him as a pupil and spy of the Jesuits. And he declared that his whole method of philosophy was heretical and opposed to the scholastic system of instruction. At his instigation, the magistrates ordered Regius to confine himself to his lectures on medicine, and the majority of the professors in the General Assembly of the University condemned the new philosophy on the grounds that it was opposed to the ancient and the true philosophy, that it deterred young men from the study of scholastic terms, and that it was conducive to skepticism and irreligion. Next, Furtius caused one of his pupils, Martin Schuchius, a professor at Groningen, to write a libelous pamphlet against Descartes, entitled Philosophia Cartesiana Sivi Admiranda Methodus Cartesi. Descartes addressed his reply to Fertius himself, who thereupon caused this reply to be condemned by the magistrates as libelous. And according to Bayet, the biographer of Descartes, Fertius lost no time in making a bargain with the executioner to the effect that no fuel should be spared in burning the books of the philosopher, so that the flames might be seen from afar. But Descartes, who at that time was not living in the province of Utrecht, but at Egmont in North Holland, succeeded in putting an end to all these proceedings, thanks to the protection of the French ambassador and of the Prince of Orange. Then the accused turned accuser, and obtained a decree from the Senate of the University of Groningen, which, in effect, condemned his two enemies, Furtius and Schuchius, as libelers. The University of Leiden, in its turn, was divided on the subject of the teaching of the Cartesian philosophy. The great opponent of Descartes in this city was Jacques de Rêve, or Revius, who wrote a pamphlet against methodic doubt entitled Furiosum Nugamentum. In 1676, after the teaching of the Cartesian philosophy had been formally forbidden, Haydanus, a Cartesian, made a public protest against this prohibition and was dismissed from office, while Folder, another Cartesian who was more skillful, continued his teaching under disguises which he was gradually able to discard. Besides the University of Groningen, that of Breda welcomed the Cartesian philosophy. In the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium it met with violent opposition. In 1652 the physician Plampius persuaded his colleagues, each individually, to condemn the Cartesian philosophy as a system which had sprung from Democritus and was opposed to the doctrine of the Eucharist. In 1662, by order of the Nuncio, it was formally condemned by the theological faculty. This was the prelude to its being, in the following year, placed on the index at Rome. But all these efforts proved fruitless. In 1667, 
five Franciscan friars came forward to defend Cartesian thesis at Louvain and dedicated them to the same nuncio, Geronimo Vecchio. The Cartesian philosophy was not merely an object of strife and a means of instruction in the Low Countries, it was the source of a new movement in philosophy. From the University of Groningen there came the Cartesian philosopher Klauberg, born at Zollingen in Westphalia, who became a professor in the German University of Herborn in 1649 and in 1651 in that of Duisburg. Klauberg was active in spreading the Cartesian philosophy in Western Germany, laying a special stress on the problems of the relation of the deity to the world and on that of the soul to the body. Röhling of Antwerp, a doctor of the University of Louvain, became professor there in 1646. In 1658, having been dismissed for his attacks upon the scholastic philosophy and the clergy, he withdrew to Leiden, and in 1665 was made a professor of that university. He was more than a mere disciple of Descartes. He refused to admit the union of soul and body, which had been accepted by Descartes, and advanced the Cartesian metaphysics in the direction of quote-unquote occasionalism, afterwards developed by Malbranche. About the same time, in the vicinity of Amsterdam, Spinoza was learning from Descartes the geometrical and rational method which he was to apply so forcibly to the demonstration of his half-scientific, half-religious pantheism, 1661-77. In France, the Cartesian philosophy was opposed by the Jesuits, who, perceiving its audacity, hastened to make war upon it with the same fervor with which they had combated the doctrines of Luther and Calvin. On the other hand, it was welcomed by the congregation of the Oratory, on the grounds that it was akin to Platonism and to Augustinianism. The Oratorian Malbranche was awakened to philosophical reflection by the perusal of Descartes' Traité de l'Homme. Afterwards, 1665 to 1712, he put together his brilliant system by attributing, through the inspiration of Plato and St. Augustine, to God himself the ideas designated as quote unquote, clear by the author of the Meditation. At Port Royal, in the church, in the literature, in the universities, and in the law courts, the influence of Descartes gradually grew to be considerable and even dominant. Thus, it was the Cartesian philosophy which inspired the celebrated Logique de Port Royal, in which the art of reasoning, which was the very end and object of scholastic logic, is subordinated to the art of thought or judgment, that is, to the art of distinguishing between truth and falsehood by means of reason or good sense shared by all men. According to Pascal, it is not by quote-unquote Barbara and Baralipton that the faculty of reasoning can be trained and formed. Quote, you must not hoist the mind up by a crane, end quote. It is mainly owing to the influence of Descartes that in the latter half of the 17th century, religion and philosophy were reconciled and came to form a harmonious whole. A Malbranche, a Bossuet, a Fenelon, far from distrusting reason, sound the praises of its power and authority. Did not Descartes show with mathematical precision that reason itself contains the principles of belief in God and of the spirituality of the soul, which are the foundations of religion? Reason, perfect and eternal, said Fenelon, is common to all men and withal superior to man. Quote, what is this supreme reason? Is it not the God whom I seek? End quote. In the 17th century, it was chiefly the metaphysics of Descartes, of which the authority was acknowledged. Towards the close of the 17th and in the 18th century, his physics and his method in general were supreme. Fontenelle, 
1657 to 1757, extolled Descartes not as a metaphysician who had attacked unanswerable questions, but as the thinker who had effected a revolution in mathematics and physics, as the promoter of the true method of reasoning. And Montesquieu, in his Esprit des Lois, 1748, undoubtedly makes use of the Cartesian method itself, applying it to political matters. The influence of Cartesian philosophy continued more and more to prevail in France until 1765, when the French Academy proposed the eulogy of Descartes as the subject of competition for the prize of rhetoric. After this date, the system of innate ideas and of vortices was succeeded by English empiricism and by the philosophy of Newton. But Cartesianism will never die out in the land where the love of clearness and of the logical connection of ideas is a part of the national temperament. Cartesianism was not as much at home in Germany as it was in France. However, it spread in Germany also, and to a great extent contributed to the philosophical movement in that country. Not only at Herborn in Nassau, and at Duisburg, near Düsseldorf, where Klauberg lectured with so much success, but also at Frankfurt on the Oder, at Bremen, and at Halle, we find Cartesian professors. At Frankfurt taught John Placentius, professor of mathematics and author of Renatus Cartesius Triumphans. At Bremen, Daniel Listorpius, author of Specimina Philosophiae Cartesiane, 1653, and Eberhard Scheveling, professor of law, at Halle, John Sperlet. At Leipzig, the Cartesian philosophy was supported with brilliant success by Andreas Petermann, Michael Regenius, and Gabriel Wagner. But the chief title to fame of the Cartesian philosophy in its relation to German thought was the important part it played in the development of the philosophical genius of Leibniz. The system of this great man, in several of its essential parts, may be regarded as an endeavor to penetrate still deeper into the principles from which the Cartesian philosophy was built up. In Switzerland, the Cartesian Robert Chouet was made professor at Geneva in 1669, among his pupils in that city was Pierre Bell. The Cartesian philosophy was introduced into England mainly by Antoine Le Grand of the Brotherhood of St. Francis of Douai, who published in London two works expounding the philosophy in a scholastic form. Samuel Parker of Oxford, having simultaneously confuted Hobbes and Descartes as alike supporters of the mechanical theory, in 1659, Le Grand indicted an Apologia pro Air Descartes contra S. Parcerum, in which he showed with what power Descartes had proved the existence of God against the materialistic supporters of the mechanical theory. Though expelled from Oxford, the Cartesian philosophy played an important part at Cambridge, the opponent of Descartes in this university, the celebrated Platonist Cudworth, a colleague of Henry Moore of Christ's College, accepted the Cartesian mechanism with regard to dead matter, but pronounced it false and fatal to religion to extend this mechanism to living organisms. Between thought and extension, he introduced a universal plastic nature by means of which God controls the motion of things. The Cartesian ideas concerning physics were introduced into the University of Cambridge by English and Latin translations of the physics of Rouault, one of the first to spread the Cartesian philosophy in France. Up to the time of Newton, this work was considered as a classic at Cambridge. The fecundity of Cartesianism manifested itself in England chiefly through the part played by it in the formation of the intellectual system of Locke, which was in its turn to exercise so considerable an influence on the entire later development of philosophy. In Italy, the Cartesian philosophy, especially as a scientific doctrine, 
established itself in the territory of Naples, the birthplace of Giordana Bruno and of Campanella. It was introduced here by Tommaso Cornelio and powerfully supported by Fardella. On the other hand, Vico, 1688-1744, on behalf of concrete, historical, and social studies, opposed the philosophy of pure reason as disregarding the phenomena relative to time and space. End of section 83。section 84 of Cambridge Modern History, volume 4, The Thirty Years' War。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 27. Descartes and Cartesianism by Émile Boutroux, Part 3. Cartesian thought is the most original and the most productive of all intellectual systems that existed on the continent in the period of the Thirty Years' War. Its essential characteristics were its conception of reason, which it regarded as the common center of knowledge, life, science, morality, and religion. It signified the re-establishment of order and reason in the intellects and in the souls of men by means of those very sciences and of those modern ideas which writers without ballast were ready to place in opposition to philosophical certainty and to the religious faith of mankind. Powerful, however, as was the influence exercised by the genius of Descartes, it was not the only important intellectual movement noticeable during this period. In France itself, two further names, unequal to each other in importance, call for mention as representing tendencies distinct from his, but endowed like it with permanent vitality. Descartes had sought to confute the free thinkers, the skeptics, and the naturalists, and, as a matter of fact, his philosophy had, in course of time, to a great extent overshadowed them. But just at first they refused to disarm, the more so because they hoped to find a fitting formula and a satisfactory defense of their theories, especially in the teaching of a man in learning, who, during his lifetime, enjoyed a reputation similar to that of Descartes. This was Gasson, or Gassendi. Pierre Gassendi, 1592-1655, the Christian Epicurean, is chiefly famous for his antagonism to Descartes, and for the point of view maintained by him in opposition to that of the great rationalist. He was born in Provence, near Digne. He took orders early in life and became an irreproachable priest. He conscientiously said mass, drank nothing but water, and was a vegetarian. He died from fasting with undue rigor during Lent, having received his holy viaticum and the extreme unction three times more maiorum. His chief characteristic is that he lived two lives, the one devoted to religion, the other to philosophy. No doubt Descartes virtually seems to have done the same. But with him philosophy and religion were finally reunited in reason, the universal source of all our thoughts, the necessary principle and guide of all our knowledge. Now, Gassendi rejected all idea of connection or comparison between religious faith and philosophical doctrine. It mattered little to him whether the two were in harmony or opposition. As a Christian, he submitted his opinions wholly to the judgment of the Catholic, Apostolic, and Roman Church. As a philosopher, he held that the truth is contained in the system of Epicurus. The substance of the world to him consisted of purely material atoms, a mind which could think without the organs of thought, innate ideas which existed before all experience, truths which could be other than the expression of external reality penetrating the experience of the senses, were to him mere idle philosophical inventions. Moreover, being of a moderate frame of mind, 
He did not consider himself bound to abide by all the consequences flowing from Epicurean principles, but the modified Epicureanism of Gassendi owes its strength and its importance to the fact that he found a link between it and modern experimental science. In contradiction to Descartes, who held that the mind more readily admits of being understood than the body, Gassendi believed that the nature of our being is revealed to us more especially by means of anatomy and chemistry. What he sees and appreciates in Bacon is not an abstract theory, a merely philosophical doctrine, but rather the positive modern idea of science and nature, such as it presented itself to a Kepler or a Galileo. Gassendi himself was a zealous student of mathematics, physics, medicine, and astronomy. He believed in the absolute worth of science as such, and declared that, when reason and experiment appear to be in contradiction, it is to the evidence of experience that we must appeal. Henceforward, his controversy with Descartes was something more than a quarrel between two metaphysicians. When Gassendi apostrophized Descartes as O mens, and the latter retorted O caro, many of their contemporaries concluded that the author of the Principes valued the ideas of his own mind more than the realities of experience, while the learning and somewhat confused eclectic teaching of the author of the Syntagma Philosophiae Epicuri, 1649, represented the advance of modern science towards the complete subordination of our conceptions to facts, to data, and to experiments. Henceforward, it mattered little that Gassendi had always been a docile Christian and a staunch supporter of providence. His religious faith was not only without root in his philosophy, but appeared to be in contradiction with it. This faith could only be maintained by means of a radical dualism, and the state of dualism is one of instability for the mind of man, which sooner or later begins to compare different assertions with one another. Now, given the enormous progress which awaited experimental science, a belief at variance with the philosophical conception entertained of this science was fated to suffer from so close a contact with it and to seem less justifiable and less important in proportion as the authority of science increased and its province was extended. And hence, Gassendi, because of the exclusively empirical and naturalistic point of view which he assumed in the domain of philosophy, because of his identification of ancient atomism with modern experimental science, represents, as opposed to the broad rationalism of Descartes, the tendency of which, a hundred years later, the Encyclopédie was the outcome. In other words, he anticipated the apotheosis of natural science as having put to flight the phantom of the supernatural and as being able in itself to satisfy every actual need of the mind of man, whether practical or theoretical. Notwithstanding the considerable reputation which he enjoyed among his contemporaries, the chief importance of Gassendi, who as a thinker was inconsistent and lacked originality, lies in the interpretation which the free thinkers gave to his doctrines. Of a very different stamp was the great adversary of the Cartesian philosophy, who is the chief glory of the Abbey of Port-Royal-des-Champs, Blaise Pascal. The most marvelous scientific capacity, a religious faith of extraordinary depth and intensity, and the choicest gifts of the thinker and the writer were united in this rare genius, which burst forth in childhood, and which death gathered in at the early age of thirty-nine, sixteen twenty-three to sixty-two. Blaise Pascal was born at Clermont-Ferrand in Auvergne. He came of a family belonging to the legal noblesse. The father, president of the Cour des Aides at Clermont, was conversant with mathematics and physics and associated with the most intelligent men of the time. He gave his son an excellent education, 
especially from a scientific point of view. The child, however, had not been taught a word of mathematics when, one day, he was then not yet twelve years of age, his father, taking him by surprise, found him employed in proving the thirty-second proposition of Euclid, which demonstrates the sum of the angles of a triangle to be equal to two right angles. In the intellectual atmosphere in which he grew up, the precocious genius of Pascal rapidly became productive. Before he was sixteen, he had formed the first conception of his Essai pour les Coniques, a work which afterwards filled Leibniz with admiration. Pascal made important contributions to mathematical and physical science. Following in the footsteps of Gérard Desargues, 1593-1662, a geometrician who was almost unknown in his lifetime, but whose works were of great utility, Pascal established the entire theory of conic sections on a general basis. He prepared the way for the infinitesimal calculus by his work on calculating machines, entitled Lettre de Détonville, from which Leibniz declared himself to have derived the idea that led him to his own discovery. D'Alembert said that this work formed the connecting link between Archimedes and Newton. Finally, together with the clever geometrician Fermat of Toulouse, 1595-1665, and Eichens, the great astronomical mathematician of The Hague, 1629-95, Pascal was one of the originators of the theory of probabilities. In connection with Torricelli's experiments on the possibility of a vacuum, which were then attracting the attention of all Europe, Pascal, in 1647, conceived the idea of the celebrated experiment of the Puy de Dôme, which proved the hypothesis of the atmospheric pressure being the cause of the suspension of the liquid column in the barometer. And by his generalizations from this result, he completed the experimental theory of hydrostatics, the principles of which had been demonstrated theoretically at the end of the 16th century by Steven, the Flemish geometrician. While making these discoveries, he examined the method which he employed in the process and boasted of being in opposition to Descartes, who, he maintained, sought for hypotheses as to the nature of things and took pleasure in theoretic points of view, while he, Pascal, put faith only in experiments. He declined to ask himself in what light consisted, or on what subtle grounds visible phenomena might be explained, but only examined physical laws, that is to say, the permanent relations between facts such as are deducible from experiments. Accurate and profound in scholarship, Pascal was also full of spiritual ardor. Early in life he happened to read some Jansenist works, and reflected on the true character of the Christian life. His impassioned nature, eager to excel in all things, caused him to welcome with enthusiasm a conception of religion which did away with the strange parallel readily accepted by the insight of ordinary men between our love of God and our love of things, and which, by acknowledging the emptiness of a world without God, bade him devote to God all his thoughts, all his love, and all his life. Meanwhile, the state of his health compelled him to seek relaxation in society, and for several years, 1649 to 53, the world again took possession of him. But a spiritual crisis of exceptional force caused him definitely to abandon the world and self and to concentrate all his efforts on the single point of living for Jesus Christ. He withdrew to the abbey of Port-Royal-des-Champs, a place which breathed this very spirit of detachment from the world. There he became intimate with the recluses and priests of that house, such as Arnaud, Nicole, and Monsieur de Sassy, and devoted all his strength to the service of God. In this strain he wrote the Petite Lettre, called the Provinciale, in order to confute, first, the subtle theology, 
secondly, the loose morals of the Jesuits. This work, by reason of its vigor, its high moral tone, its wit, its intensity, its dialectic force, its oratorical and dramatic power, is a masterpiece of the French language and of the mind of man, and withal one of the most forcible attacks which Society of Jesus has at any time sustained. According to Pascal, the vice inherent in the teaching and practice of the Jesuits was that of lowering the ideal of the Christian religion in order to bring it to the level of the natural man. To entice men and to get them into their power, the Jesuits declare that God only requires of us human virtues. They degrade our duty to the level of our capability, of our weakness, and of our cowardice. They relax their rules in order to adjust them to the weakness of our will. They corrupt the law to render it conformable to our corruption. Consequently, they detract from the necessity and the importance of divine grace, and go so far as to resemble Pelagius and the pagans rather than disciples of Christ. In opposition to the doctrine of the Jesuits, Pascal maintained with the utmost force, on the one hand, that we are commanded to love God and to live for God, and on the other, that divine grace is needed to accomplish a perfection which surpasses the power of the natural man. His arguments may be summed up in two statements. First, God is our end, and again, God cannot be our end unless He is at the same time our inspiring principle. Hence, it is impossible to agree with the Jesuits in admitting that the end justifies the means. He who uses means condemned by God is not of Him and does not work towards His glory. The casuistry of the Jesuits was, according to Pascal, the enemy of the Church from within. Without she had an enemy no less terrible in the skepticism of the free thinkers or philosophers. He determined to crush the latter as he had crushed the former, and, inspired by a miracle which he believed to have taken place in favor of Port Royal, from about the year 1656 onwards, he devoted all the energies spared him by his serious ill health to an important work directed against atheism. In 1662 he died suddenly, before he had been able to complete it. He had only made a few notes, fragmentary sketches and suggestions. These, which were reverently collected and published with ever-increasing care, constitute what we call the pensée of Pascal. They are the disconnected thoughts of a genius in whom the mathematical mind is blended in an almost unique way with the most ardent passion and with the most facile and most original gift of style. Like Descartes, Pascal wishes to confute the skeptics and to convert them. But in order to accomplish this, Descartes thought it sufficient to compel them to acknowledge the existence and authority of reason, which, according to him, contains the principles which attest the truth of religion as of science. But it seemed to Pascal that to remain content with proving the supremacy of reason left the point at issue still undecided. For reason of itself has no fixed principles and can serve in the cause of error as successfully as in that of truth. The haughty Stoic and the complacent disciple of Pyro invoke the name of reason and both lead man to his ruin. Pascal, therefore, passing beyond the boundary which limits the province of philosophy, undertook to demonstrate directly the truth of religion itself, and religion to him signified Christianity. The method which he employed for this demonstration was at the same time most vivid and most subtle. Indeed, faith, according to him, comes from divine grace, and no demonstration could take its place. But it behooves man to strive, with the help of this very grace, to remove the barriers set up by the soul's corruption between itself and God. Pascal had in mind the free thinkers of his time, 
those superficial scholars who, impressed with the power and progress of science, professed to find it all-sufficing and employed its results as weapons against religion. Himself a scholar, with more than an amateur knowledge of science, and one who had given some thought to the scientific method, he determined to turn against the skeptics their own arguments by showing how the truth of religion is to be deduced from those very sciences which they had placed in opposition to it. Pascal, who was not only a mathematician, but also a student of physics, refused to admit that in order to attain to the knowledge of reality, one should proceed otherwise than by the observation of facts and by arguments based on this observation. Now, the freethinkers prided themselves on having supplanted God by natural man, who, according to them, possessed within himself all the elements of his science and of his happiness. Man suffices for himself, they said. He needs not to bow down before something higher than himself. The scientific method, Pascal replied, requires that before attributing such perfection to human nature, we should first observe it from an unprejudiced point of view. What, then, is man taken in his actual and natural form? A mass of contradictory elements, a chaotic medley, an enigma. Each of his faculties, in fact, aims at an end which it is incapable of accomplishing. Happiness is our goal, and all our actions merely procure for us deception and disquietude. We demand justice which is not based on force, and in reality we can but decorate force with the name of justice. In our sciences we seek for complete demonstrations, and in our arguments we only succeed in avoiding progression towards infinity by falling back on hypotheses based on sentiment and, since demonstration here becomes impossible, admitted by us without demonstration. In a word, human nature, lofty and noble on the one hand, is low and petty on the other. It is an irreconcilable medley of all that is great and of all that is base. This is an undeniable truth. A scientific mind should start from this and attempt to explain it, just as the student of physics attempts to explain the strange phenomenon of the suspension of a liquid column in the barometrical tube. Now, reason cannot itself explain the presence of two contradictory attributes in the same subject, but it so happens that the Christian faith supplies us with an explanation, according to which the subject, which appears to us as being one, is in reality twofold, containing on the one hand divine grace and on the other fallen nature. As a hypothesis, this explanation is convenient and possible. Its truth remains to be proved. In dealing with this latter point, Pascal appeals to the documents of history. He attempts to show how, in the face of innumerable obstacles, the Christian faith has established itself in the world with a power and with results which attest its divine origin. But he also invokes an argument of a different character, which, according to him, is as capable of demonstration as the assertion of a phenomenon in physics. This consists in the individual experience of the working of God in ourselves, the realization which comes to us in moments of inspiration, of the tie which, even in this life, unites man to Jesus Christ, and through him to the Father and Creator. Hence the work which Pascal intended to accomplish was a demonstration of the truth of Christianity on scientific principles. Not that he meant to substitute human means for the action of grace, on the contrary, he constantly declares that love and faith can only come from God himself. But he thought that divine grace, instead of acting as a substitute for human effort, is its incentive and its guide, and that it makes itself felt by actions 
wholly conformable with the fundamental needs of our nature and of our reason. The originality of this demonstration lay in its starting not from the examination of religious matters or of the idea of God, but in its taking up the actual standpoint of the opposite side, the standpoint of nature claimed by the freethinkers as a substitute for God. Pascal contended that nature herself and science, which is but the rational interpretation of nature, can only be conceived by a thoughtful and reasoning man by presupposing the existence of God, the very God of the Christian faith. The Pensée of Pascal, which were published posthumously by his Port Royal friends in 1670, at once attracted a widespread attention. They showed that it was possible to combine the humblest faith with the most rigorous scientific insight. And this striking example did not fail to influence that large number of minds who never dare to think in any particular way unless they are sure of being in excellent company. But the work of Pascal chiefly consisted in the exact and clear expression of a certain attitude of the human mind when confronted with the problem of the relations between religion and science. He does not regard religion as a domain apart, wholly unconnected with our natural life. Religion is the explanation and the principle of the true realization of our very nature, the key and the goal of all the sciences. Thought, action, and feeling are really consistent and salutary only if they start from God and end in Him. Religion is the light and the force of science and of life. The several tendencies of which Descartes, Gassendi, and Pascal were the representatives were not merely notable phenomena characteristic of the atmosphere and of the epoch in which these philosophers had their being. The very brilliancy with which these tendencies were expressed by such men as Descartes and Pascal led to their dissemination among all nations and throughout the ages, and ensured to them a great historical importance. But this is not all. More profound than the phenomena which are but the expression of the genius of a particular period or of a given phase of society, these tendencies seem to comprise in themselves the various ways in which the modern spirit, taken as a whole, reacts when confronted with the problem of the connection between science and religion. With Descartes, philosophy, properly so called, finds in human reason the common source of our knowledge of nature and of our beliefs concerning the supernatural. With Gassendi, or rather with the class of thinkers whom he came to represent, science tends to be self-sufficient and to banish religion to the obscure retreat of individual feeling till the time comes for altogether expelling it. With Pascal, the supreme guidance of reason, science, and nature is claimed by religion, unproving that it alone can solve the problems inherent in nature, science, and reason. Religion, science, reason, are not these the three teachers of humanity, the three powers which even today struggle for the control of the moral world? And even today, are we not asking ourselves which of these three is to overcome and subjugate the others, or whether they may be brought together in a lasting and beneficent harmony? End of section 84 End of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War.